Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Abdullah Samia Show. I am joined by two young, <laughs> two wonderful young men today. <laughs> friends, very good friends, Yunus and Ibrahim, not the real names. We're using pen names for privacy reasons. Yunus grew up in West Africa in a small town where everybody memorized the Quran. When I say everybody, I mean this was like the norm. You and he's going to go into more detail um, as to how exactly this happened. Um, are you guys hearing me okay? If the sound's okay, just let me know. Thumbs up. Let me know everything's going fine so I don't keep talking. Um, so Yunus grew up in West Africa in a small town, like I said. He came to America. He had to start from scratch, not only learning the language, but just basic skills because all he was doing was Quran, Quran, Quran. Eventually, he overcame all this, got into a successful program, at university and he's studying the field of his well, basically what he wanted to study um and the amazing twist in this story is how he got his best friend ibrahim and he was talking to his best friend and both of them were, ended up leaving islam which is so amazing i mean i you rarely hear that happening usually it's the opposite <laughs> usually you know one person leaves islam that maybe the husband and there's a wife that doesn't want to leave Islam or, you know, friends leave you um, to can, to maintain a friendship after leaving Islam is just amazing. It's just, it's very, it's very great. Yunus, how's it going? Hey, uh, Abdullah Samir. Thanks for having me. So i um, glad to uh, come in and just talk to everybody about this. So we'll see. Um, we'll see how it goes. But yeah, so my name is Yunus and I uh, left Islam uh, about, I want to say almost six, uh, five, six years ago now. Um, and now I am just studying at a university as a, a scientist. So I'm working on my um, doctorate in embryology. So we can <laughs> we can go into that a little bit as well if you guys would like. Nice. Um, but yeah, so I'm here today and I brought my friend uh, Ibrahim and we're going to just share our stories with you guys and just sort of journey we went through and how we got to where we are now. Awesome, awesome. Ibrahim, uh, how's it going? Good, good. How are you? Thanks for good. also having me and uh, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, so uh, we didn't introduce you yet. You are from uh, North Africa as well. Uh, both of you are American and yeah. um, it's interesting. So you're, you're a native Arabic speaker as well in this case. Yeah, I am. Okay. Arabic is my first language and then I learned uh, English later on. Okay, beautiful. So so here we have two different people from different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Both of them um, only connected, I would say, to Islam and friendship. And then the friendship stayed, Islam didn't stay. So yeah. this is awesome. I'm, I'm like, I'm so excited about this. So Yunus, let's go back to the very beginning. Yeah. Let's go back to yeah. when you, like, let's go back to uh, like your hometown. Tell us about what it's like growing up over there and your yeah. family situation. Yep, sure. So um, so I grew up in West Africa in a little, a very tiny town where it was the norm for people to just memorize the Quran. Um, as a kid, as a five-year-old kid, instead of going to, you know, elementary school, you'd go to elementary chronic school and you'd learn um, the Arabic alphabet. You'd learn how to pronounce all the sounds and things like that. Now you don't know how to like you don't understand Arabic like you don't know what it means but you're just learning how to read it essentially, um, and so that's what I did when I was five. I just started doing that, um, learning all of the alphabet, learning how to read, and then eventually started memorizing um, entire chapters of the Quran and you know be able to recite them. Like the teacher would sit down and you would sit down and. Um, you know, with your teacher and you'd recite and they'll say, recite this chapter and you would have to do it, you know? Um, and it's done in a way where, believe it or not, right now the government there is actually starting to crack down on these schools because they're so uh, severe. Like they beat you if you don't memorize it and stuff like that. I mean, it's very backwards <laughs> the way they do it. Oh, wow. How much did you end up memorizing of the Quran? Oh, yeah, I, I ended up memorizing more than half. So I ended up memorizing more than half. So oh, yeah. quite, a, quite a bit before I came here. Hmm. And the reason I came here, and I actually came here when I was a teenager. Um, um, and the reason I came here was that so I could go to school. Hmm. So there, 
I didn't go to school at all. Like, wow. I, I just did not learn anything that's that you would consider education. Like, it, I was just learning the Quran only. Um, so, so you were telling me that there's something interesting that people do. They yeah. they leave the country and they leave. So you were actually by with just one parent, right? And your other parent yeah. was in the U.S. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, that's that's a common practice where people will leave their kid at at you know a Quranic school for years to just learn the Quran, and they won't see their parents for years at a time. And that's that's what happened to me. I actually didn't get to see my uh, dad until I was like eight, and didn't see my mom until I was like a teenager, basically like after coming here. Wow. Um, and that that's very common. That that's not even seen as weird or anything like that. Uh, why do they do that? Uh, it's just the 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 fact that you're learning the Quran is priority. So 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 they put that at the top of the list. You have to be raised like with the Quran. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. So so if you're not raised with the Quran, then you're not you're not a disciplined child. You're not really a child where, like, you know, that they would be proud to, you know, say that this is my son, you know, and stuff like that. So this is just something they did as sort of to even be a regular human being. It's very weird. Um, but uh, yeah, so that that happened to me. But eventually I did find my way into the U.S. Um, but before you, before we get to the U.S., tell me a little bit more yeah. about the, the, okay. the madrasa yeah. system there. Uh, yeah. How, what is life like? In, sure. You know. Okay, I'll go into that. So, the madrasa life is that you have all boys living in the living in the school, um, and you have to you get up in the morning, and you have to recite your piece, right? So you go to your teacher and you recite your piece for the morning. Okay, so you have to have a new piece, a new part of the Quran that you memorize every day, and you would have to. Um, pick up that piece at night, and then by the morning, you should memorize it. So the morning, you would come in, you recite. And you write it down. The way you memorize it is you have you have the book, right? You have the Quran given to you or portions of it given to you. Um, and you have, to, you have to read it, and then you have to write it down as well. So you would go and read it multiple times and write it down as multiple times. Notice... We don't we don't understand anything that it's saying. Like I might as well be reciting a a lyrics to a song from a foreign language. Like it's 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 like that. It, I, I didn't get it. I didn't understand it at all. But this was just the norm, you know. At the time, my mindset wasn't, you know, this is weird or this is this was just what to do. This was just the thing to do as a kid, right? Mm -hmm. Um. And, and uh, it's, so, it sounds very Sufi leaning. Is it like very, a very Sufi it, type of thing? You have like a, a sheikh or a, a, a yeah, murid it, and a master kind of relationship? Yeah, that was good that you picked that up. Yeah, so it's actually very Sufi. Um, mm -hmm. The sect the, the sect that we um, practice over there, or at least I used to, is is um, Sufi leaning, sort of a branch of Sufism. Um, and it's it has a leader that lived in the 1800s, you know, all of this and all of that. I don't want to go into all that, but um, but yeah, it's a Sufi leaning practice. You have a master sort of, you know, student relationship. Um, so it was actually very peaceful. It didn't have any of the, you know, <laughs> extra and all that. Yeah, all of that. No, it it didn't have that. Yeah. Like people there were relatively very peaceful. They taught a peaceful version of the Quran, a loving yeah. version. Um, although, yeah. although I will say that the fear of hell, the, 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 they teach you that they, they, they make sure that goes in your brain early, especially, especially the part where you have, you get questioned in the grave. So this was my biggest fear actually growing up. Um, so imagine as a six year old, as a seven year old being told that, when you die, you're going to be buried. I mean, that's already terrifying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not only that, but you get questioned by these demons and angels, you like, know, angels yeah. and, you know, and things like that. And you have to say the right words and stuff like that. And it's just <laughs> very, very terrifying, very terrifying. Um, so that's the sort of thing, you know, that was heavy on my mind. And we will go into that a little bit Um a little bit more when I get into how I found my uh, how I found my way out.
Mm. Yeah, and then, you know, yeah. Wouldn't you say? I mean, it, honestly, when I hear things like that, I I yeah. feel like I sometimes agree with people when they say religion is child abuse. I mean, yeah. it's kind of like you know, it's not a very healthy parenting style. If I yeah. only used uh, fear tactics to raise my kids, let's say as a non-Muslim, I'm like, if you don't yeah. study. You know, I mean, I mean, parents sometimes do that. They they use fear mongering, right, but like right. this is like ultimate fear mongering. This is like you're gonna have your skin burned alive, boy. It's like you know a different I mean? level. it's definitely a different level. That that is a good point. Um, I think, I think psychologically, it's it's a very um, effective indoctrination tactic because as kids. Um, and you know we can go into <clears throat> we can go into the biology of this, but as kids we have the tendency to listen to our elders, right? Mm -hmm. So if you imagine just biologically, as a child you haven't really made it so far, but the adults have. I mean, the adults have at least grown up in the, in this environment which is new to you as a kid, and so they must know better than you. So just, yeah. just our brains are set up as kids to be very receptive to what adults tell you um, and then using fear, right? So we have a very strong survival mechanism as kids, like kids have a very strong survival mechanism. They have to be, right? Just evolutionarily, this is the way it has to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you use a fear tactic that could, you know, like hurt them or um, endanger their life in some way, it's very effective to get them to stay in line and really follow. And it makes yeah. it very hard to, to escape that line of thinking once you, you know, once you're a grown up, you know, like once you're yeah. Grown, yeah. It's very difficult to escape that. Yeah, absolutely. Ibrahim, I, I want to ask you about this, this whole thing about memorizing the Quran, uh, coming from an Arabic background. Um, what, how do you find, find that? Like, because you you obviously do you understand it completely? Is it like some of the words are kind of off? Because I know I used to have an so, Egyptian, Egyptian friend, and he knew Arabic, but he also found some of the Quran, you know, his Quranic language kind of awkward. It's not like it's not the same as modern standard Arabic, obviously, right? Yeah. So um, a lot of the countries in, in North Africa who speak that speak Arabic, they speak different dialects, mm. but we kind of come to the like the formal Arabic like that we use in the news channels and stuff like that. So I would understand a lot of it when I tried to understand it. Like, but a lot of the words were harder to understand and like needed translation. So I would actually say it was like a 50-50% with understanding what's going on versus not understanding what's going on. But you had to put effort um, to understand truly what's going on. But like as a kid, um, most of us didn't care about that. I was I was in Sunday school for a little bit, like for, for the most uh, of the part growing up, so like uh, like religious school where we memorized the Quran, it wasn't as intense as Eunice's um, <laughs> yeah. Eunice's madrasa, but yeah, <laughs> uh, but yeah, there was like of course like the casual beating and stuff, you know. Oh. But we just tried to avoid that and uh, by right. memorizing, and we didn't really care what it tried to tell us. But was that yeah. back home, or are you talking about in America? Um, well, that was back home in America. Oh. Like, so I was I was old enough when I came to America. To, to like avoid that i was actually um a teacher in the sunday school when i oh. came when i was in america because i was starting to teach a little bit and help um other kids memorize but um i didn't beat up anyone i promise <laughs> i i took i took the approach of more like uh encouraging and like positive rewards i, I mean i don't know why i did it that way but it seemed to me more humane um, <laughs> you have a heart that's why <laughs> so can, I, can i ask you this ibrahim so um, when uh, Abdullah was asking you about how, even though you, like Arabic is your first language and all, when you're reading the Quran, it may still be difficult for you to understand. The way I think about it is, is sort of like trying to read Shakespeare or some old ass yeah. Eng English, you know, text. Like it's English, yeah, English yeah. is your first language, but you don't really get it. Th these words yeah. aren't used in the same way anymore. Is it? Is it kind of analogous to that? I would say I would say that's like a like a good analogy, but like multiply Shakespeare times like one point five or, it's or two almost, and then like that that's where they're because a lot wow. of the words need translation, and then uh, a lot of the words were um, actually explained differently by different teachers because sometimes mm -hmm. in classes 
Well, one, I would get bored in classes sometimes. So I would start asking questions. And like, I loved asking questions and I kind of had a lot of curiosity. So, so I would ask them what that means, what so that specific word means and other teachers would explain it differently sometimes. Oh, okay. So I that, that, that kind of, yeah, that kind of like was a little off to me, but I didn't think too much about it. Right, 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 right. That's very, that's very interesting actually. Um, hmm. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, just to get a different uh, second's perspective. So Eunice, yeah. So going back to that, so there's a fear of hell, um, the wall, like religious yeah. brainwashing, which, like you said, it's very difficult to get rid of, Absolutely. even when cognitively, yep. you know, you understand this doesn't make sense. Yes. Emotionally, you can't let go of this this nagging fear of yes. like self doubt. You know, yep. I was taught this when I was a kid. You know, my parents taught me this, and. And un unfortunately, like you said, we've evolved a certain sort of way that things mm. that you things that you teach children, you know, that's why we have to make sure that kids are, are raised properly because right. you know, like that's why that's why we protect our children from predators because they're so easy to manipulate. Absolutely. Right? Like like I you have this like which again I, I find so strange how how they're able to like, you know, in this culture of yours, how they just leave the kids behind. Yeah. To study the Quran. I find that so bizarre. It is bizarre. Like I I did not think about it that way <laughs> until <laughs> talk, you know, just talking about it, I see yeah. how odd it really was. Yeah. But uh that's how it's done because your kids have to be raised with Islam. They have to be raised with <laughs> the Quran in their hearts. This is the this is what they say. You need to put you need to put God's word in your heart. This yeah, you're doing your kids a favor by leaving them there. Like you're doing it for their sake. Like you care about them so much because you want them to have the infinite better life. So you're yeah. sacrificing that and doing it for them. Maybe out of love sometimes, I think too. Yeah, Ibrahim yeah. put it perfectly. It's literally like that. That's how they see it. It's you love your child, so you are doing this to them. So you are putting them, you know, through this so that they can be good people. That's the thought, right? You're trying to save them from yeah. eternal damnation, right? I think so. that theme that theme makes perfect sense because even as a Muslim, I kind of thought that way too, that mm. like I didn't say Allah is an evil monster, but I mean, now I will say Allah is an evil monster that will hurt to you if you don't comply. So you better fast five times a day. I mean, fast every day, pray five times a day, all of these things. Like I had that sort of motivation without yeah. the evil monster part. I'm like, okay, well, this is God and I have no choice. But like, I have to make everybody Muslim in some mm. way or another. I mean, obviously you can't lie to them or whatever, but, yeah. but like you have to convince them because yeah, it's for their own good. It's like, it's right. like if you have an evil king that's yeah. going to break your legs if you don't bow down to him. So no, you've got to convince everyone, hey, this guy is going to hurt you. So you better freaking listen to him. Not because he's good or he yeah. deserves it. Yeah. Because you have no choice at the end of the day. Right. Look. Look, Abdullah, so this is, this goes to the reason, this goes to something I was thinking about, and it is the way you approach uh, your channel, for example, is that you tend to uh, approach it from, you know, less harsh, you know, just saying these people are stupid, they're dumb for not believing, you know, for, for yeah. believing, how can they do this? Instead of, instead of that approach, you go uh, for a more, um, a more, I guess I, I'm going to call it like, even you understand their motivation. I mean, you have to imagine if you believe that Islam is true, then you should spread it. Like if you believe, if you believe that, you know, all of this is real, like you want to save people. I mean, this is actually, this actually makes sense. Like this is the, it would be insane to think that it's true and not want to do anything about it. Like that's, to me, that's more crazy. And so the way you approach it, um, I think, you know, is, is very effective. You know, other ways are effective as well, but still like the way you approach it is effective because like I said, it goes down, it digs more at what their actual motivation is than just them being stupid and being, <laughs> dumb, you know, that, that, I, that, is, that is there, but still. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I think, I think, okay. So yeah, there's two parts to that. I think some people 
when you say stupid, I think some people actually do have low intelligence. <laughs> and unfortunately, <laughs> it's very hard to help those people because oh, yeah. they just don't get it. They just freaking don't get it. They just want a simple explanation for everything. That's they just right. want everything to click in perfectly. They're not okay with doubt. They're not okay with uncertainty where... I think part of becoming emo um, intelligent, part of being intelligent is being comfortable with doubt, comfortable with not knowing. Like it's yeah. okay to be agnostic. It's okay yeah. to say, I don't know what the hell this world <laughs> place came from. Like, I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know if there's a God for sure. I'm yeah. inclined to believe there's no God. I, I don't believe I'm atheist. I'm not. It's not like agnostic and atheist are like two different categories. You can, yeah. I'm agnostic atheist. I don't think there's a God. I definitely don't. I definitely know there's no Allah. I definitely right. know there's no revelation from any, any sort of God. But like yeah. when you go through that yourself, like you said, when you, when you yourself were that religious person yeah. and you were in that bubble, you know, that helps you to have, to have empathy for other people, to understand what they're going through and to see it from that perspective of, and I find that, you know, for example, like Richard Dawkins, who was never religious, he just doesn't get it. Like, he doesn't understand. Like, when someone asks him, like, one of the questions that was asked to him was, what do you tell people that say that now that I've lost God, I have no purpose? Mm -hmm. And he was just like, I don't know what to tell them because I get up every day and I have purpose. And, you know, he, he didn't understand. He didn't understand, like, how difficult it is. Right. But people that the entire like life is, you know, going around this like God idea, this religion and, and what what a trauma it can be for some people. And, and how even if it's not a trauma mentally, you know, there's a lot of things in your life that have to change for you to actually get out of it. Right. Yeah. So absolutely. and the reason I love, you know, having these interviews is because it shows people that like this is how we need to look at others. Like look at listen to the story. Listen to how you know, these people, you know, became more mature, how they evolved, how the thought processes changed. I think it's beautiful. I, I that's why I love doing this. I, I agree with you completely, Abdullah. Like and it in a way it's so much easier to like just believe. Like it's you have like everything is known, everything is written. You just have to do this to do that. You have a book, you have a rule book for life. Like who would and who in the right mind would choose to like dismiss like or like not have a guidebook for life rather than just not knowing like no one really wants that but like it doesn't stop it from being true or not you know yeah, yeah. oh yeah no that's that's perfect so <laughs> exactly it's if you have if you have a book that tells you how to do everything right and that's islam like it's very meticulous <laughs> it, it's very it's very precise in many ways, but also like it's unprecise in a lot of other ways that it should be precise. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. I got uh, I got to tweet that. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's uh it's only precise in certain ways. Like you know, like what you should you do if you like lay in. I don't know. It's it it has so many tiny, very particular things. You know, my parents would tell me how to lay down correctly and yeah, how to see, you have to sleep on the right side and on the left side and. Like, but I know <laughs> it, you, yeah. you're exactly right because yeah. it's like in minute detail on certain things, but completely absent on like the more important things. For example, consent, like yeah. getting consent. Like, I mean, this is something that you know, as an evolved society, we consider important. It's important. We don't, we don't, we don't, you know, marry children. We don't sleep with little children because of the idea of consent. A child yeah. is not emotionally mature and cannot consent because they don't understand what they're getting into. So in cases like this, it's completely missing, you know, yeah. the whole idea of cousin marriage, you know, how so many societies, Muslim societies now have this problem of repeated cousin marriage. There's no advice in the Quran about not marrying your cousin. Muhammad married his cousin Zainab. Muslims marry their cousins all the time, you know, it's fine oh, yeah. once in a while, but to do it repeatedly over and over again causes genetic issues. And we all, we know that, right? So beautifully said. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's exactly, that's exactly the point. The, the idea of consent does not exist in many religions, not just Islam. Yeah. Uh, I think this is just human 
It's, like, it's, it's human it's, modality that's evolved. <laughs> Frankly speaking, right. our modality now is better than it ever was before. I'm, Absolutely. I know Muslims don't like to hear this. I know they disagree and they think that our yeah. modality is going down. Yeah. No. That's because our morality has gone up, way up. Yeah, so they think the reason they say our morality has gone down is because they, they look at it from the perspective of God, right? So if you're looking at it from the perspective of Allah, if you stray from, quote unquote, the path, then your morality is going down. Yeah. So, so all of these uh, modern societies, modern ways of doing things, these are straying from the path is the idea. So morality, you know, like... It's argued that morality is going down, but that's only from this narrow perspective. If you look at it, if you look at it holistically, like if you look at it in terms of, you know, um, if you look at it in terms of how we're treating other people, yeah, how we yeah. treat animals, how we treat oh, women, yeah. how we treat children. And Stephen oh, yeah. Pinker's um, book, I keep thinking, not Enlightenment now, the Better Angels of Our Nature, has shown has demonstrated, de demonstratively proven beyond the shadow of a doubt. We are so much, we treat everybody so much better today. Violence has gone down. Murder rates have gone down. Crime has gone down. Um, women's rights are so much better. Children's rights we, in ancient society. Human sacrifice has went down too. It, human sacrifice, <laughs> not not just not just the extreme examples of human sacrifice, yeah. but for sure you're right. That's completely yeah. like un- totally unacceptable but even yeah. like for example um issues like people used to kill their children yeah right like either kill them or let them die and this was part and parcel of being a human because there was times where you just had no choice you had to let them die because of limited resources Absolutely. but today no way we find ways to make do you know you you have the government that'll come in or you know there's orphanages there's even you know religious institutions will come in and help out yeah. so as humanity we've actually bonded together and you know improved a lot of these things this is that's perfect point let me just make let me just make one thing real quick let me just say something so what that reminds me of is one time i was having a discussion with um one of my family members uh and we were talking about the um disabled that live in in the country you know the, the country where i came from and how they're treated and stuff like that now compared to people how are, how disabled people are treated in america okay um as an example so we were talking and um and i was going on about how we as a country and i was talking about my home country at the time i said we as a country have to do better in the way we treat our disabled people. I mean, they're living in the streets. You have people who should be on wheelchairs, but they can't, they don't even have that. They're crawling on the floor, begging for money. And this is ubiquitous. This is everywhere, you know, where you go there in the cities. It's, it's, it's a horrendous sight to see versus in America where, you know, if you're disabled, you even get a check from the government. You get you know, you get taken care of. You got parking spots just for you and stuff like that. So that goes about the morality thing. So I was telling, I was like, I was telling this family member who is a Muslim. I was like, as Muslims, right? We should, shouldn't we do better? Like, why is America beating us in this in this part? You know, and I think this made them think a little bit. You know, yeah. Like, wh why is America more charitable? <laughs> I um. Yeah, I'm gonna say America is more Islamic. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I'm just kidding. The thing you know, is, they I mean, actually say, um, like, like in some countries, or at least from the country I'm from, they say that um, here in our in like the Arabic countries, we have uh, Muslims with no Islam, but in the West there's Islam without Muslims. So that's oh, cool. there's a quote for you. <laughs> Oh, which which, makes, like, which always bothered me. Like, that's like a normal quote there. Uh, yeah. But it bothered me. I'm like, don't, okay, whatever, you know? <laughs> no, no, things, little seeds like that make you think. It, it forces you to think about the system that you live in. Like, is this system actually the best system? Or is it, if it's, if it's, if it's being bettered, like if it's being beat by another system, then like, what does that mean about your system? It's supposed to be, it's supposed to be, the best one, you know, it's supposed to be the, the, the divine system. one, 
But do you do you see how Ibrahim said how they flip the narrative and how they frame it in the way that they want you to see it? Oh, these wonderful societies where they take care of disabled, where they have wheelchairs, they have elevators, they actually care about disabled people. Oh yeah, that's the Islamic country. Like that's yeah. Islamic rules. Our country, no, 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 no. I mean, you know, like that's that's Muslims, but not. But the thing is apologetics you should see you should see like the fruit of islam in the society like right. when i was when i was visiting egypt that's one thing that really stood out to me and I, I, it's not totally fair to compare like canada or america to egypt because of difference of like the difference in level of ink you know the the gdp or whatever but sure. even even in the government like buildings over there where clearly honestly dude people buy custom furniture there because it's so cheap like you just, you customize the couch the way you want it. I want this leather. I want this furniture. I want this design. And it's like the guy will build, build it for you, like on the spot. Like you can't even get that here. Over wow. there, you get custom furniture, okay? And people can afford it. I mean, the middle class or upper middle class. Wow. But the, but the, the government buildings where honestly wouldn't be very expensive to put yeah. a wheelchair. There's no wheelchair lamps. Yeah. There's, there's nothing there's, there's nothing like that. Oh, there's yeah. no idea that we should even bother with wheelchair lamp. It's just not even and you know, part of it too is Maslow's hierarchy where you know when the base is settled and there's food and there's everything and then the next level comes and you know eventually self-actualization. So when you when you have all mm -hmm. of these things taken care of in a society, then you can worry about disabled. And I haven't I mean I went to Saudi, I haven't been to like Qatar or some of the rich Kuwait or any of those rich countries. So I don't know if they are comparable to America. Um, I'm guessing not, frankly speaking. And frankly speaking, okay, the most disgusting toilet I've ever been in my whole life was in Egypt. I almost, I swear to God, I almost vomited. It was so nasty. And this is a Muslim country. And I've never, ever, 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 ever seen something that disgusting in my whole life in Canada. <laughs> ever. There was like, I don't even want to tell you what I saw. It was like shit everywhere. And like, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I'm like, what the hell is it? And I'm a Muslim coming from Canada thinking, this is when I was Muslim, obviously. And I was thinking, you know, Islam teaches people to be clean. Like, you know, the Western version of Islam, right? Islam is all about yeah. being clean. And, <laughs> and it's yeah. like, you go to Muslim countries and you're, you're horrified. They can't line up. Oh my God. Oh, I, I just, yeah. I don't even like, I'm just like, <sighs> they don't the line lines. up over there. They butt in line. Everybody's butting in line. There's no lineup. <laughs> there's no civil, yeah. they're not civilized over there. Like over here, there's a lineup and freaking people sometimes butt sometimes, but over there, there's no line. Everybody's you, you're, you're looked down upon if you, if you line up there, you look like <laughs> less of a man. Probably if you're like, what are, what are you? You're not a man. You're in the line. Oh, go, go God. get your place in the line. <laughs> Uh, Ibrahim, I think uh, I think Abdullah <laughs> is shocked by going over there and seeing how society it does not function the same <laughs> the same way. Yeah, it common doesn't, sense, really doesn't. Common stuff like lines don't exist in these countries. Yeah, but like, yeah. like here's here's the thing they'll brag about. They'll brag about having bidets and saying that West like America is gross because they don't use bidets. Yeah. But look at the bathroom here versus there. <laughs> it's, it's it's like look at we have a bidet. It's covered in poop, but yeah. hey, we have a bidet. <laughs> and then people take showers regularly, right? That's the thing here. Like you just I mean, non Muslims, they they might not use a bidet, which I think they should use. I think it's cool. I still use one. Mm -hmm. But like they or like a lota, which is a daisy version, which is a little like flowering pot with water. I still use it to this day, but I, you know, they do take showers regularly, so it's like either way it washes out. But yeah, obviously one is better than the other, in my opinion. I think that's an objective that didn't come from Islam. That's something that was there yeah. before Islam. Islam emphasized it, even though I, for some reason you don't see that in the Muslim world. You do see the bidets everywhere, but you don't see the cleanliness. The cleanliness. Oh, yeah. So I want to talk about how. Eunice, how how society is affected? How this society? How's the employment rate and all that? When when you have a complete society of people that all they do is all the kids do is memorize Quran, how how does that society like thrive? How does that society grow? Like what what do you see in that society when you go there? Oh my God, that is such such a good question. So basically. People, the way people are provided prim primarily over there is that a family member goes to a Western country 
and then just supports supports you know the rest of the family. That's basically how how it is. Employment over there is incredibly low. I mean, the unemployment rate is high, right? <clears throat> and it's because people are not um, are not educated. You know, if you go to the capital of this country. Uh, you have more people working in industries and people working in, you know, more regular, more more or less regular jobs. Um, but these rural areas, like I said, because of this idea that they need to learn the Quran and this is the first, you know, first and foremost, their kids never, they, they I mean, opportunities are just cut off from them before they even, like, see it, right? Um, and that was the case. That, that was going to be the case for me, you know? Uh, but my my parents had enough sense to actually, I guess, realize that I won't be able to make anything of myself if I stay there, and that's why they brought me here. I'm I'm thankful for them for that. Um, but but yeah, that that that's the case in a society where you have the Quran being and Islam being prioritized. You have regular life. You know, you you have modern life as a sacrifice. So you have to sacrifice, you know, regular things like jobs. You don't even get jobs. I mean, I can't tell you how many cousins and how many, you know, um, uncles I have who they have no job. They're just sitting down at their house, um, just waiting for people to send them money, you know? Wow. And, and that's how they have to live because they have no education. They have no education whatsoever. Um, so they can't they can't find a job or one of the most common things people do over there is that they become a tailor. So they just start sewing clothes um, or they start becoming a merchant. They start just buying goods and reselling them, you know, and they travel around the country just doing that. Um, so because of because of the system and the way it's set up, um, it, it it's holding that society back a lot from advancing. You know, you. I mean, can you imagine how many people go into sciences because of because of that, right? Um, I, I'll tell you about how I got into science in a little bit. But um, in a society in a society like that, if you if you don't have kids going into science, your society cannot grow. I mean, that's just that's just the way it is. You have to have your population study science so that you can advance. I mean, the good thing about science is that it's universal. So whatever it is dif- discovered in America unless it's discovered by a company or something and made profit, uh, if it's discovered by, you know, a public university, it's for everyone, it's, a, it's for everyone to, you know, to gain. Why is science so important to a society's growth? Why do you, why do you say that? Because science is the foundation. Science, science is the foundation by which you can find ways to uh, feed your people, like, effectively, right? So you can grow more food because you can study you know, the weather, you can study, you know, crops and things like that, you know. Um, and then on top of that, you can study things like technology and you can make goods, right? You can make things and ship them overseas. You know, you can invent stuff. You can build robots. If you, I mean, just look at Japan, right? So, th- I mean, <laughs> their society is just basically run by robots, right? They have robots everywhere. Um, and it helps, I mean, Japan, because of their scientific literacy, you know, in many ways, they have excelled even America. And, you know, in America, it's not like the pinnacle of, I mean, there's lots of flaws in America, of course. Um, but still, just having science in a society and having people study science, it's how you advance morality forward, because that's how you learn about the real world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's you improve the quality of life with science, which exactly. is interesting, because you have, you know, religion that gives you dua and prayer, Oh, yeah. But you you have science curing people's eyesight, like blindness. <laughs> Sorry, blindness. Curing. Okay, look at me. This is technology that I had. Without this, <laughs> I can't see very well. Absolutely. This science and technology gave me this. Yeah. There's going to be a time that's coming, and it's very, very close, where you can actually see because of neural implants, even though you can't see, your eyes are damaged or there's a, there's a wiring problem in your brain. Mm. I mean, this is improving people's lives Absolutely. far more than and any I, god, any religion, any sort of belief system can so, really give you, right? Yeah. So let me just yeah. say one thing. Let me just say one thing, and then Ibrahim can jump in. So here's a thought. Why is it that the Muslim countries, the ones that are receiving the most prayer, 
the ones that are that prey is coming out of. I mean, if you if you had sort of um, a world map, and you map on where prayer is coming from the most, it's going to be from these religious countries. But they're going to be the poorest countries. They're going to be the the countries that are worse off. So if there was a study done with prey, I mean, this enough debunks it. I mean, this is enough. Like we have enough data to say that it doesn't work because well, you all are no. Um... God works in mysterious ways. Yeah, of course. See, I was I was about to tell you, Eunice. Like, I, I, I'm really I feel like I'm good at answering these questions, and like the way I would answer this is God is punishing these areas so they can live better and the afterlife. He's 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 cleaning their sins for them. Oh, they can become so, better Muslims, right? It's a yes. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. yeah so, you, you make a good point. I mean, you make a good point, which to me actually. I, as a Muslim, came across an article, a study or whatever, that said that, you know, I was surprised to find this, that prayer actually had an effect on people's healing or something like that. Yeah. And it turns out this was like a prank or something like that. I, I It was like an April Fool's <laughs> joke or something. And, and I, when I sent it to my atheist friend, he, he said, you know, this article you sent me and I can't find it now, but... He said this study was made as like a as a joke or something, right? And I was like, really? And then he sent me another study, which was a Harvard prayer study. Mm. Where they tried, oh, yeah. to, they tried to test, they tried to show whether, you know, to study whether there was any effect of like prayer on people's healing. And what they found was, you know, well, one, there was no effect of prayer. Obviously, there's no effect. Prayer doesn't do anything. But I mean, they wanted to study it. It was actually paid for by Christian Foundation, the Templeton Foundation. They wanted to study. They were hoping it would show that prayer actually had an effect. And the worst part, the worst part of this was the people that they were that were told that someone was praying for them, they took longer to heal than the ones that didn't have someone praying for them. It's almost like they felt anxious, like, oh my God, someone's praying for me. I have to get better. It, <laughs> it made them worse. <laughs> oh my God. That's that's well, hilarious. Hilarious. that would be hilarious if it wasn't so sad. Yeah. If you ask Muslims, they'll say, Well, you can't you can't study this, you can't measure this. Well, if you can't measure it at all, even on a on a country level, then how is it real? Like, I mean, that's what statistics are. That's how car insurance rates work. Young men aged, you know, 16 to 21 get the most accidents on average. I might be the best 16-year-old driver in the world. I never get an accident in my whole life. I'm so conservative. I'm always checking my blind spots. But on average, this is what happens. Smokers on average are 50% more likely to die because smoking has an effect on your health and so on now dua seems to not be visible at all whatsoever in any way however we try to measure it it's like look, look abdullah you're you're thinking about these things from a scientific point of view and you yeah. can't religion yeah. is not scientific yeah that's just the bottom line. It's not because it's not real. <laughs> not right. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? If it was scientific then it would just be reality, right? Yeah. Um, but it's not. So that that's why these things, you know, measuring things and stuff like that, that's not spoken of. It's not it's for it's a foreign idea because it's not scientific. Religion is not scientific. That's before just, before bottom. you before you move on with your story, you were saying how technology improves society. And now, today, technology is used to spread Islam. Oh, like you, yes. The Dawa guys on YouTube and like these live satellite channels that, that are broadcasting Islamic stuff. Like yeah. it's it's technology that's being used. At one point, the microphone was considered haram, right? Now it's like, yeah, we'll gladly use the and microphone. Photos, and photos and cameras. <laughs> You're trying to recreate God's creation. What are you doing? Yeah. Right? Yeah, I remember that when my uh, when I was first Muslim, people were saying, "Oh, it's halal, it's halal." Now nobody says that. It's yeah. like suddenly it's changed. It's become halal. Oh, it's too, it's normal enough now for it to be. Halal. It's too ubiquitous, right? It's just day part of our lives. I mean, how do you get yeah. rid of like photography? It's just like this. The the hardliners are still exist. They still exist. I think the the very yeah. it's hardcore Salafis. They don't even use like emojis. I remember one Muslim lady telling me, "You shouldn't use emojis because it's halal." I was like. Huh? Wow. It's like, like yeah. or something. It's like I don't know. It's it's like so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Okay, so now uh, I guess I'll go on to talk. Yeah, about, please. Yeah, to talk about um, my journey afterwards. So once I came to America, I began. I, I didn't speak any English, so I had to learn that. Um, 
And that took me a little bit. It actually didn't take me that long. Um, so, I, you know, I, I was relatively young when I came here. So, and I was surrounded by it. Like, I, I mean, it, it just, you know, no one really spoke English here. Uh, I mean, uh, sorry, d like my native language. Yeah. Uh, so I was forced to learn English very quickly, uh, learned how to read, learned how to write. But because I didn't have any prior uh, former edu uh, formal education at all, I had to start from the very basics. So I had to start from learning things like basic addition, subtraction, multiplication. Um, I had to learn, you know, just very basic stuff that people, you know, most people learn when they're in first, second, third, you know, elementary school. I had to start with that as a teenager. Um, but thankfully I was able to catch up fairly quickly and, um, you know, graduated high school and then went into college. Uh, and high school is actually where I met where I met Ibrahim, and we'll go into that in a little bit. But this whole point, I was Muslim. Okay, so I believed in the religion like wholeheartedly. I had no doubts in my mind whatsoever. Um, and when I was um, when I was in my mid teens, like around sixteen, seventeen, um, I became very religious. I I. I became, I mean, I just took a nosedive into religion because I started to think if this is true, if this is true, this would, I mean, the consequences here are dire, right? So I became enamored with the idea of the afterlife. I became, uh, I became just absolutely entrenched with Islam. I was reading I was reading the Quran like all the time. And this time I was reading it in English so I could actually understand it, right? Um, reading translations and stuff like that for the first time, right? So I could so I actually get what it, you know, what it means and things like that. And at the time, you know, I, I didn't have any doubts. I, I mean, it was profound for me to be like, wow, I'm reading God's words. I mean, this is absolutely amazing, right? Um, and I became- so they, they never ever taught you the actual like thing? No. No, they, they, they don't. Uh, well, okay, they would eventually if I stayed there. Okay. If I stayed there, eventually, once you memorize everything, they teach you what it means. Um, but that takes years even. So, <laughs> Wow. So, yeah. So, because I guess according to them, it's already part of the culture there. Like the stuff right. you do, you say Bismillah or whatever. Yeah. They're yeah. like, they don't think, they just take it for granted that this is the Muslim way and we don't need to like explicitly. Exactly. I guess. Exactly. Yeah. And I'll I'll go into the, I'll go into the history a little bit and like how Islam got there and stuff like that actually, but um, could that actually plays into what eventually made me leave? Okay, so um, became super religious, was praying all the time. I mean, was just you know, <laughs> I was on the right path, right? Um, and then when I graduated high school, um, I I started college a little bit. And then I started to get into science, okay? So I started to consume a lot of science content, um, just started following science news, started learning about the Earth, the Earth's past, started learning about stars and the universe and things of that sort. Um, so this was just like when I, began, when I began college, right? So I was just doing this like on my off time, you know? This was just something I was just kind of interested in you know i didn't know i was interested in science but apparently i was because i was just looking into it and this was kind of the beginning right so this was the beginning um but it wasn't the end all be all okay for the most part i still believed i, I still i still followed everything you know the way it goes but um so you hadn't you at this point there was no cognitive dissonance yet there was, there was no cognitive dissonance yet in fact I started to watch people like Zakir Naik and Ahmed Didat <laughs> um, uh, because, you know, these these apologists, they talk about how there's scientific miracles in the Quran, right? Um, and, and, and things of that sort. So I used to consume that type of content and that made me believe in, I was like, wow, I just got interested in science and turns out Islam is actually scientific, right? And this is because, well, <laughs> I didn't, I, I didn't quite know enough science to really be able to judge this or not yet. But at the time, this was impressive for me, right? Um, and so I, I continued that, um, and it was just super profound for me. But then, one time, I remember, I think this was in, um, 
This was in 2014 when I took my first chemistry class in college. And I was learning about atoms and, you know, once again, like I had no concept of this whatsoever. Um, this, the, the, the education here in America is, I mean, the public education here is not that great. I mean, they don't teach you that much about science, to be honest. So I didn't know about atoms and chemistry. And when I took my first chemistry class, like it almost opened up my perspective a little bit more. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Is this how our world actually works? Like these chemical reactions are happening in my body right now. That is just profound. Like this is just amazing, right? Um, and everything was about measurement and preciseness and how the scientific method works. And I began to like think, I was like, wait a minute, like the Quran that's claimed to be in the science or the, the, the science that's claimed to be in the Quran is, it's not like that. It's not that precise. It's very, it's very vague. You know, it's not, it's not robust as of like, you know, what I was learning in class. Right. Um, so that was kind of the beginning, but here is, here's is kind of where things really began to shake up for me. So I remember one morning, um, I wake up, I woke up to pray Fajr. Right. And I was in the middle of the play, prayer and I started to think, I was like, why does God require me to perform these odd movements in order to be right with him? Like, why do I need to, why do, why does he need people to do these sort of things and rituals for him to save them from hell? Like, it was odd for me. It was like, God is so grand. He's so great. Why, why these petty things, you know? Um, but that was just questions in my mind. Like, I didn't start really doubting, right? Ah, so that was yeah. the first little hole yeah. in the canopy that the light yeah. started to come in. Exactly. So, so the, it was it was these little things that started to kind of come up in my mind, um, and started make me wonder. But um, I continued to just you know sat there and think about, and and then later I started to think about like why does God even burn anyone? Like why would why would you want to burn anyone? Like even the worst, the worst person in the world yeah. burning for all eternity. Like, what is the purpose of that? Like, what would that even do? Like, is that going to teach him a lesson? No, because they're never going to be saved from it. It's not like they're going to learn anything. Right. Yeah. So like, what's the point? I don't understand. I just didn't get it. So these questions started to come up in my mind. Right. Mm -hmm. And and it's, it's usually, it's even worse than that. It's not, it's not for the worst people. It's for non-Muslims. It's for disbelievers. Yeah, whether or not they're good people, it's just disbelievers are going to hell forever. Muslims maybe yeah. for some time, but disbelievers will go to hell no matter how good they are. Bill Gates, oh yeah, all of them would who know Islam and reject it will go to hell. Yeah, so know who knowingly reject it. That's what they say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but yeah, so these so these things started to come up in my mind, and I remember the first I I remember to this day. The first time I realized that I was actually doubting. Um. I was like, wow, I, I, I became mentally, I, for the first time, it, it was conscious in my mind. It was mental, I was mentally aware that I was actually doubting. And then I prayed to God that these doubts went away. So I started to, you know, just hold on even you know, like harder. You know, I, I, I just started reading more and things like that, <laughs> but it didn't help. Like the more I read, because, because I was getting into science and had this new way of thinking, this this sort of more, um, you know, rational way of approaching things, it became very difficult for me. And later, I remember um, certain verses in the Quran that would say things like, "Do do you not think, or do you not reflect on these things, and stuff like that?" And you know, people always say that you know, Quran actually encourages encourages doubt <laughs> and stuff like that. So I kind of bought into that. I was like, okay, fine. All right, let's look into this then. So I started to sort of, um, I gave myself permission to be able to actually look at it rationally for the first time, instead of just reading the Quran and just becoming enamored with a profound word of God. I started to really look at it in a sort of, um, not not quite yet skeptical point of view, but more rational, just more relaxed, open-minded sort of sort of um, mindset, right? Um, but I find myself, you know, consuming a lot of science and a lot of scientific thinking in general, 
And so suddenly I was able to scrutinize and see the flaws in the arguments and these apologists that I used to listen to. Now they don't oppress, like they don't impress me anymore as much. <laughs> um, I'm like, wow, I, I see how fallacious their arguments are and frankly how unscientific they are even, you know? Um, so yeah. you can imagine, you can just imagine all of this culminating and my faith just stood on shakier and shakier ground, right? Um, and then <laughs> I remember one night I was like, I don't know if I actually believe it, genuinely, genuinely believe, okay? I don't actually know if I'm convinced that if this is true or not, okay? And the main reason for this was just because I learned um, more about how the real world works and more about, you know, reading the Quran and going, like, when you read verses that talk about sheep and camels and, you know, shackles of silver, like, all of these very... Um, ancient, very outdated uh, ways of thinking, a very, like when I read the Quran, des like describe the world, it's, it's geocentric. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it, it's like very primitive. I was like, man, we are so beyond this. Like, why is the Quran talking? This is the, this is the word from God. Like, why is it even like this? Why does it seem like it's man-made, frankly? Okay. You know, what you're saying. Yeah is precisely what happened to me mm. precisely what happened to me wow i became scientifically literate i mean nowhere near to where you are because i i went down the technology route True. but like in my spare time i'm reading about science articles and as i gained knowledge yeah. i started to look at the quran and be like this is weird <laughs> And eventually, you know, but like, wow, like what, like, this is impressive. I want to, I want to ask okay. you a question before we move on. Okay, sure. Go ahead. About, you know, someone's asking, um, name Grace. Why, why is it appeal to, to Zaka Naik, do you think? Why do you think people like, like look okay. up to him and why is he so popular? Okay. The main reason, and I had learned this recently, I, I learned this not very long ago, but the main reason is actually psychological. The way he, the way he, um, conducts his speeches the way he recites the Quran fast and gives you a speech and then sits back down and gives you an answer. It's almost like he knows the answer to everything. And it's like, it's very um, like authoritative. Like, wow, like this guy has the answer. If you have a question, he has the answer. If a Christian has a question, he has the answer. And not only that, he'll give you a chronic verse that seemed to answer that question. So this was very, it's very impressive for a human being to be able to just do sort of things like this. We, we find it, um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's almost like, satisfying. yeah, sat very satisfying. Exactly. It's very satisfying to just hear him like recite the Quran so fast and speak so quickly and so eloquently and be like, I'm a medical doctor, you know, all of these things. Yeah. Um, Another thing I noticed about uh, how like he yeah. answers questions, they mostly show on YouTube the questions that he fully answered with confidence. And then like, oh. they don't show you what happens afterwards. Cause it's like, let's say he asked 20 questions and he answers three of them. They show you the three of them of that, that was all that was asked. But another thing is like, um, like Whoa. they don't give a chance for the person. Sometimes the other person who asked the questions wants to like actually clarify and isn't satisfied, but they don't give them that chance. Yeah, they cut them cool. off. So <laughs> that's something I noticed. Like, because at one time I was like, wait, wait, what about that part? You didn't answer it. And yeah. the guy was almost trying to ask it, and they were like, no, sit down. Yeah. Yeah, wow. So there's even that type of play. I didn't even know that. I didn't even think about that. But, yeah, that's – wow, that's true. That's that's okay. an amazing answer about the psychology. I think that's that was be that was a beautiful answer. I wasn't expecting that. Mm. I wanted to say that um, what you said – I want to actually just kind of expand on that about what you said about Zaka Naik and the scientific miracles and how that, that appeal also – how it satisfies some people because they're having doubts about the conflict in the mind, the cognitive dissonance yeah. between the science, what the science is saying, what the Quran seems to be saying. And they're yeah. like, well, this guy has solved it. He, he's yeah. like, he's even saying, he's going even further. He's doubling down. He's saying yeah. the science is in the Quran, it's predicted in the Quran. So he's doubling yeah. down. And and like you said, combined with the confidence, I mean, that just wows yeah. people. Exactly. But, but the devil is in the details, right? Like when you start looking into it, yeah. Like you said, when you start to become scientifically literate, now you're like, 
this isn't right. Yeah. Yeah. It becomes very, I mean, I was shocked. Like, so I, my field is biology, right? So I was shocked to, um, to learn how Islam actually doesn't align with evolution. For example, this is, this is one mm. huge, I mean, this, this was the straw that kind of broke the camel's back for me in a lot of ways. Um, cause I was thinking about the story of Adam, like according to Islam, how humans originated is very different from like what we actually know. Okay. It's very different from what we actually know from, from like data and looking at like real, like real stuff. Right. It's very different from the stories and, you know, getting into biology and learning a little bit more, I was like, oh my God, like this is obviously a fairy tale. It's, it is a story that is told um, and it's not even, Islam didn't even invent it. That's the thing. Christianity didn't even invent it. I mean, Adam and Eve, these stories were around ages before and they were just changed and incorporated as people move to different civilizations and culture builds on. These stories just change over time and eventually we're left with this product, right? With this product of Adam and Eve that really came from years and years of iteration of the same story, right? Ad like addition and iteration of the same story. Yeah. I mean, there is no scientific thing to it at all. There is no scientific anything to it at all. Um, and this was one major thing for me, mm. uh, you know, that kind of like, once I learned this, you know, because you know, when you listen to Zach and Ike, I mean, he doesn't believe in evolution. <laughs> He's a medical doctor. Yeah. Okay. What is that? Right? He doesn't believe in like, like if you don't accept the science of evolution and you're a medical doctor, like, I don't know what to tell you. You know, it's just, you haven't, you haven't opened your mind up. Let's yeah. just say that. Yeah. Um, you, you might, you might be shutting some things down that you don't want to accept. Um, but, uh, okay. So now I kind of want to get into. Before we do that. Uh, before okay. Continue, I, I want to make an appeal uh, for support for the channel, if that's okay with you guys. Yeah, sure. Go for it. Yeah. So we're at the one hour mark now and uh, fellow subscribers and uh, people who are new here, please consider joining the channel uh, to support me financially, to continue making more videos and doing more interviews like this one. The amount of time it takes to produce videos, to do these interviews, to research and all of that. It's quite a lot of time, actually. People don't realize that. I would love to do this full time. This is something I very much enjoy and I feel like it's contributing to society in a way that I cannot do from my nine to five job doing coding. So I would love to do more of this. I would love to spend time, more time in producing such content, talking to wonderful people like Yunus and Ibrahim here. Uh, Yunus is from, from uh, West Africa and Ibrahim from North Africa. They're telling us the story of how they were able to leave Islam and, uh, you know, channels like myself and others actually, in many ways, contribute to people who are looking, who are searching for answers. So if you are new here, please do consider subscribing. If you can afford it financially to support me, I would appreciate that as well. Um, for as little as $2 a month, you can keep the channel in. You can tell YouTube that I love this channel and I'm willing to give you money. So, you know, keep the channel alive. Um, Channels that, you know, go on topics like this don't always fit into the sort of liberal leaning bias that tech companies have. And they tend to sometimes even shut down the channels. David Wood has actually got many copyright strikes and many strikes in general for content that that's perfectly legitimate. And um, so I know that if I continue down this road and I get channel big enough, I'm going to have the same challenges. So having financial support that's going into YouTube's pocket tells YouTube, keep this channel going because it's making you money. So as well, a lot of the channels cannot, a lot of the videos cannot be monetized. So please do consider supporting me. Thank you. Okay. So now that I've said that, said my two cents, uh, Eunice, if you can please uh, get back to this. Story. Yeah, no, that's important. That's important. The, the work you do, people, people should support this type of thing. Like it's like, it takes a certain amount of bravery to be able to do this. And if no one does it, like this is the, I mean, this is the definition of just complacency. Like this is how you change stuff. Like what he's, what Abdullah is doing is literally like the way things change, you know? Um, so it's, it's really important and very worth supporting. So 
Um, let thank me you, thank now, you, Vanessa. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Let me now go into how um, I met Ibrahim and how you know he plays into you know this whole journey. But um, as I kind of alluded to earlier, we met uh, in high school. We actually went through the same high school together and stuff like that. And um, and uh, we became close friends. You know, we we were both Muslim at the time. There was a certain time. There was a <laughs> there was a period where I wasn't Muslim, like I had already left Islam, but kept it under wraps with him. Like I didn't tell him at first. So me and him would go praying together still. You know, if I would go over to his house, we would pray together. We would go pray uh, Juma sometimes together and stuff like that. Um, but I, I didn't believe, but I didn't tell him. Um, but he did notice, I think he'll tell you, and I'll let him, you know, let him share his uh, view, what he was thinking at the time. Um, but I think he might have noticed certain things about me that he just didn't, that he, he never con like connected two and two. Because look, when you're in Islam, it's, it's almost, sometimes it's almost impossible, at least that's, that was in my case, it's impossible to even think that it's possible to leave it. Like that possibility doesn't even exist in many people's brains. So they don't even think that, they, that never crosses their mind, okay? So that was a main player, but eventually, I remembered actually the night that I told him for the first time and it was, we were at the masjid and someone was getting, actually someone was converting to Islam. Someone was converting to Islam at our local masjid. Yeah. And I was kind of going through it. And of course I didn't believe at the time. And, you know, um, and I was like, wow, these people are like, I feel bad for them. Like they're about to, waste their life. I mean, in these Muslims are acting so nice to them and all of this in the beginning, but they really don't know what they're getting into, you know? And I just became, I felt like I had to say something. And so when we left that whole, um, that whole celebration, um, I was with, uh, I was with Ibrahim in the car and I told him, I was like, Hey man, uh, by the way, I, I don't believe anymore. And I just remember seeing the shock in his face. Okay. Um, I mean, he, I mean, it was shocking. Right. And, uh, I, I, I remember at the time he was asking me why, and you know, like what, it, what is it about the Quran that you think is wrong and, you know, things like this. Um, so Ibrahim, if you don't mind, um, uh, maybe just go into like, how did you feel at that time? What were you thinking about? Like, what were the type of emotions that went through your, <laughs> your brain that your best friend yeah, Not it was out forever. It it was a lot. So, like, before I explain that emotion, I want to yeah. like kind of give some background to it. So, Absolutely. uh, like, growing up, I would ask a lot of questions, and like the example you gave Abdullah of the canopy, like the hole in the canopy. So whenever I had a hole, I would just like put gum in it, or like like just like put like some like not like I don't know some per not up. permanent seal yeah a band -aid. I had to patch it up like little band-aid little band-aid so um if we keep that canopy image in mind i kept getting a lot of holes throughout my life and i would just keep putting band-aid and like th even through like school or in islamic school i would ask questions they tell me like you shouldn't ask these questions you shouldn't um you shouldn't even try to think about these things which was was hard like i would ask like <laughs> like Don't where think. did yeah, like I just out of curiosity, I would ask questions like, where did he come from or what does he look like or stuff like that. And they would just get like not happy with me. And then um, when I came here in high school, like I had I had a wonderful teacher. He would go out of his way to help every single student. He would go out of his way like so many hour after hours to help me out. And then um, we eventually started having these little debates. And he was he was an atheist and I was like Muslim at the time. So we would have these intense conversations and he would be very respectful and like he would take the time to talk to me about everything. And no matter how I looked at it, this guy was a good guy. He would go out of his way to help people. He volunteered in like, a, like, like shelters. He just mm. spent every single ounce of his time to help people, but he was atheist. So like that, that part of me was like, okay, there's something, how can this guy be punished? like that badly like he's genuinely a good person um and that was a big other hole like the way i patched it most of the time was um there was an explanation about how people who weren't presented the religion right 
were not um, fully responsible and they would be offered at the end, at the end to, to join the religion when they die. That was the, my main to-go patch. So um, moving forward, um, I started, when I started going to college, I took a class, uh, a speech class that kind of taught us how to listen. And it was, it started at the art of listening. And it was basically explained how everyone you listen to in the world has something to offer and you can, like, you can learn something from them. And he's said, everyone you learn, everyone you talk to is an expert at something. That's the quote I remember. So I started getting more into the art of listening and how, because I learned there's a lot of benefits to it. So I tried to listen more. And then I tried to like do new things, learn new things. Um, like I tried, started doing like martial arts, just like random things in general. So all these things were like little holes. And then I met um, a lot of, a lot more amazing people who were just like good people. And I would tell them about Islam and they would like, it wouldn't add up to them. And I was like, okay, they're going to turn around eventually. There's something like not adding up here. And then, um, yeah, so like the final blow moving on to that car ride with Yunus. And then he tells me this and I'm like, wait, no, that's like, this can't be true. And like my first emotion was ironically fear because I started doubting like jinn. And mm -hmm. from what I understood at the time, if you, when you doubt jinn, that's when they mess with you. That's when they possess you. That's when they like, and I heard numerous stories growing up about like jinn, how they can like do all kinds of things. So <clears throat> that, that blow, the first thing that triggered was fear that because I'm questioning it, I'm like, okay, maybe there's something like something wrong. So I took the approach of, okay, I'm going to become that expert. So, I, so I'm able to help and save my friend because he was my best friend and I wanted to do anything, like anything to save him. So I took the, like the approach of, um, I will become that expert. I will, because a lot of the times people would answer, oh, you're not an expert. You can't answer these things. You don't, you don't have to answer these because you're not an expert. And I was like, well, if I'm going to live like this and my friend is not going to be part of it, I will become the expert so I can save him and give him all the answers he needs. And yeah, and I was just like that. I, I remember that ride home, I was so fearful that anything would happen on the ride home because like, I didn't want to die doubting, I guess, or like questioning mm -hmm. or, and then slowly I just became more focused on learning the truth and kind of figure out the expert, quote unquote, to, to be able to save my friend. And uh, yeah, that was, and slowly as I learned more and more, um, it just became harder and harder to like defend. So like I would watch like videos for hours and like read so many things. I read science books and all these things to try to connect everything together. But like w with time, the more I knew, the more, the harder it became to answer the questions that Eunice had for me, like basic questions. And then I started having questions of my own. And then it just, it just became slightly like there was a point where snowballed. yeah snowballed and then the, and then all the band-aid on the canopy <laughs> just <laughs> fell apart it and burst. it was like it, it just burst like light was coming in from anywhere everywhere and like all these like i described them as knots i've had these little knots that i tried to save on the side in my head for the longest time and they just all kind of came out and the example i was telling Eunice is like it's like you know these little puzzles of pictures when you have like that has a hidden word like it's it's made with patterns and you can't see the word and then you see the word and when you see that word it becomes almost impossible to unsee that word like mm -hmm. it's there you can see it like so that's yeah that canopy analogy. was just that's a really good analogy like those yeah. you know, abstract art pieces where there's something hidden in there and you don't see it at first, but once you see it, you cannot unsee it. Really, you cannot. Can't that you way. really can't. That's a so, real. Um, yeah. So after that, the canopy is just shattered. After that, pretty much. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, that took that that whole process took I would say a couple of months. Like there was at one point where I was like, um, like yeah, right now this is the point I don't believe. It was actually ironically during Ramadan when it started happening. Wow. And um, yeah. And then I remember one time I was like, 
I don't know believe where the gins are supposed to like gin, people, uh, everything uh, is supposed uh, to be way. Yeah. So how did it happen in Which Rumble? Is, it's impossible. Exactly. Which is the gin and the shaitans were like um, chained during these times. So I was like less worried about any any of these things. So I kind of went in like <laughs> like too worried, I guess. Interesting. Because they were chained now. I can think freely now because they're chained. Yeah. You know. You know, it's um, interesting that um, actually a lot of, you know, you might not, you guys might not know this, but a lot of people leave Islam and Ramadan, including me. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. makes sense. It's when they're changing. You, <laughs> all of this Islamic stuff is forced upon you yeah. and you engage with it more actively compared to like the rest of the year where, you know, it's yeah, a little bit more passively. Yeah. And in this one month, it's so intense that you are forced to kind of face your cognitive dissonance if you have any. Um, yeah. I wanted that's, to say, I, I think... Good. I, I want to say, I think you made a really good point about how um, living among non-Muslims actually helps a lot. When you have these people in Muslim societies like Pakistan or Saudi, and everybody's Muslim around them, and they don't interact with non-Muslims, it's easier to think that, oh, those guys are going to hell. Like when you meet people like that that atheist guy you met that's a good that was a good person, and some, some of my best friends now are atheists. I mean, like even when I was Muslim, I, I started making atheist friends, and they were like, good people too and i'm like yeah and, and here's like, not yeah, here's the thing right? abdullah yeah yeah so like and they and they don't want you to be friends with people who are not muslim <laughs> like i almost part of me felt guilty when i hung out with someone who isn't muslim and me not um trying to help him and convert him which is one of the reasons I, I like i felt so um like so inclined and comfortable hanging out with yunus because he was muslim but he thought like me like like people who were like trying to grow people who had a growth mindset so i like like loved hanging out with eunice and loved being friends with eunice for for that reason and many other reasons and on my mind he was muslim so i was like okay i don't have to feel bad i don't have to feel guilty because technically you shouldn't befriend people who don't believe yeah and this is what's this is what's taught to you this is the childhood indoctrination you know ibrahim was saying like when i first told him he felt fearful because he was indoctrinated as a child. It goes back to exactly what I was saying earlier about how our brains are set up as kids to like have these things locked down. And so, I mean, he felt fear and it was hard. He, I mean, he mentioned it was hard for him to shake that fear. Right. So if you yeah, want to. And I felt, I felt exposed at some point because like, for me, I always read the morning, morning azkar. So like I felt protected by these things. I had God protecting everything I had to do. And then like when that fell off, I like I felt vulnerable and exposed and it wasn't a great feeling at first. Mm, um, yeah, but, I know that feeling too. Like when, when I first, the very first day I stopped believing in God, Islam and automatically God, I was like, oh my, I mean, I was going to say, oh my God, oh my God, I'm all alone in this universe. There's nobody <laughs> out there watching yeah. And you feel like naked kind of because you're like, exactly. I was going to say naked. Yeah. All along yeah. you feel like someone's watching you and sort of taking care of you. But all of a sudden you're like, holy shit, I'm anything could happen now. And, and exactly. like, I can't control it. And, yeah. it's not, and it's not, yeah, it's not planned. It's just whatever happens. It's just, it's, it's not written. Silly, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and what you said about the knots in your head, man, that, that like describes to a T like what I felt when I started to like, have doubts between the science, the way the Quran was like a good example of the knots in your head. I think that that I would I would see was when I read the story of Isra wal Miraj, and Muhammad is going up to all the different heavens, the seven heavens, and he's stopping at the different heavens and meeting the prophets. And I'm thinking in my mind, like looking at the sky, I'm like, okay, well, there's the moon, and then there's a other planet. I'm like, where was he going? Is he going in space? Like he's going up. So he must have oh, traveled yeah. to space. I'm like, okay, well, maybe the whole universe that we can see is the first heaven. So he went through the whole universe, 13 billion light years, whatever. I yeah. Know, at the time. <laughs> and then he went, wait, wait what's like, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, the mental it, model doesn't nothing, match, yeah. Right? It's yeah. like, and then people don't know the Quran also says, and the Hadith says that, and there's seven earths too, not just seven heavens, there's seven earths, right? And it's, it says, there's seven heavens we created. And then it says, and similar for the earth, right? And the hadith yeah. actually says each you go down, each earth is like 7,000 years or something like that. And each heaven is like 7,000 years away in terms of traveling or whatever. So like, it's a very strange yeah. cosmological model. Oh, yeah. 
completely at odds with the the reality, basically. Yeah, and I actually chose to like disconnect completely, like what I was learning science-wise. And then I started learning like psychology and astronomy, and I actually started studying these things. And like I became fascinated with them, but I felt like I was tied down to think and delve into these concepts because they were against a belief I had. And once they that knot was like solved. I was able to fully embrace these things and learn about them. So yeah, like it's just once, you, and, and then once you jump in like that, you start becoming like very knowledgeable of how different and untrue things you believed were. Indeed. Um, did we, it seems like we lost, um, we lost Eunice. Yeah. Let me, let me reach out to him. Make sure. Yeah. So maybe um, next while, time. while we're waiting for him to come back, um, you know this this story i have to say is it's like you guys are my brothers that i never met <laughs> um honestly it's like the things that you guys are saying and you know honestly it's i mean the best word to use is blessing i don't i you know blessing isn't obviously like a religious term but yeah but, um it is a blessing to have friends that can actually go through this experience with you for me i actually made new friends when i left islam and i realized who my real friends are because all yeah, the friends yeah. I had who I thought were my friends, suddenly now that I'm not Muslim, and I'm not just not Muslim, I mean, let's be honest, it's not just because I'm not Muslim, it's because I speak about Islam and I write about Islam. Of course. I'm blogging about Islam, and that makes them very, the very uncomfortable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And like yeah. just by association, they could just be bad and like get sins just for it, you know? You're like a pot of sins for them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh. Yeah, I want to I want to say something. So like, um, Abdullah, what you were saying earlier about how you were trying to make sense of this whole idea of like the heavens and how just the model that Islam presents is very like weird and very outdated seeming like you can't make sense of it, you know, and there is a simple answer for that. It's because it is outdated. It is. <laughs> it's made by <laughs> It's it's made by yeah. people from you know from thousands of years ago who just yeah. didn't understand how the world worked. And one thing I do remember reading the Quran one time, and this was another blow to my to my faith. Uh, I was learning about the stars and learning about the universe and like what the stars are made of. They're made of hydrogen. You know they burn for billions of years. I mean all of these scientific things, right? And I came across a verse in the Quran that said something along the lines of um, God, like, don't you see that God created the stars so that you can navigate, you know, to pilgrimage. And I'm like, what? Yeah. Like, what is this? You know, like God created the sea so you can get beautiful jewels and food out of. I mean, it's the whole concept that the universe is made for humans did not sit well with me at all because oh, everything yeah. signals like this is not true. Yeah. You know, like, everything. Like this one, right? Yeah, precisely. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I made, yeah. I made these uh these balls of glowing gas that are millions of years uh <laughs> billions of years old, basically. Yeah. Yep. So that you guys can travel in the water. Some of them, some of them, some of them have <laughs> planets of their own. Some of them have planets and worlds of their own that we will never know about or would never know about if it wasn't for science because the Quran wasn't going to tell yeah. us about them. So the extent of knowledge, if, if we were just um, restrained to Quranic knowledge, we would never know what these things were in yeah. real life. Mm -hmm. We would just, the only view of them we would have is that what is described. They're just lights so that you can navigate. You know, I actually remember asking um, one of my teachers, like, why do we have stars? Like, what's the point of stars? And oh, the wow. answer from my teacher, and he was like a religious teacher. Yeah, he, uh, he answered, "It's so when the jinn come out, the sh the stars <laughs> shoot them back." Like, oh, like, and there's there that's that's in the Quran. It, yeah, it roughly basically explains how if a jinn tries to show up. Th that's what a shooting star is basically yeah. it it's a, it's a jinn being shot down so he doesn't yeah. show up so <laughs> yeah that's that, so that, that that's one of those knots that didn't sit sit well with me at all yeah <laughs> also 
when you when you start thinking that everything is made for you, you kind of treat it a lot worse. And that's mm. something also that I never liked. Like people truly believe that everything is made for them so they get to treat it as if it's their own in a way and like yeah. treat it in uh, not in a in a careful way if that makes sense climate change so there you go uh here's here's one thing one of my family members recently went to um uh the country that i was born in and they're they're they're, they're children they're small they're like um they're like eight years old or something right and when they came back i asked them i said what was the most uh, what was the most memorable thing that you saw, right? This is what I asked. This is what I asked her. What was the most memorable thing that you saw? And this is just a kid, right? It's this eight year old kid, right? And she told me she was like, there was trash everywhere. There was trash on the beach. There was there was plastic bags um, everywhere. No one cared about littering, right? So she was she was born here. Uh, like race here. So here they teach you like, don't litter, don't throw stuff on the street, things like that. And this concept just doesn't exist in these countries. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it goes back to what Ibrahim was saying. Look, as a human, if you have this mindset that something is made for you, something is infinite, like somehow the earth is not a limited resource. It's just for you to exploit. You tend to do that. And we've been doing that for years. And honestly, look, um, it's not like the West has been an angel in this. No, the West has recently just realized how much damage is being done. And this is because of science once again, right? So it's not that it's not like religion came and told us that this was bad. No, it's science. We figured out that we're destroying the planet that we live in. Okay? Yeah. The way um, a lot of people, unfortunately, who are religious think about it is, oh, that's just the day of judgment is coming. Like this is the expiration date for the planet. We're just leaving now. <laughs> like, Everything is going down because we're leaving. We are, That's it. We are we are fulfilling our own prof prophecy. They're not constructive about it. Yeah, they're not. They don't want to fix it. Yeah, you they're know, they're not gonna go. Sorry, go ahead. Finish. Finish. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no. I was just saying, like, uh, like we, they just would see it as an act of going against God's end yeah. of the planet in a way. Like, what what are you trying to fix? Like, you don't <laughs> think God can fix it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would, as a Muslim, I would have countered that with um, the whole thing about Muhammad saying planting a tree, even if the day of judgment comes to still plant it anyways. But like the whole expiration date you said is actually a very, very good analogy or theme for how the world is going to be destroyed and how some people actually, not just Muslims, but some fundamentalist Christians want to bring about the day of judgment and uh, how they want to bring you know war to the middle east because they want they want it they want to destabilize the world and isis actually has this and so the this is one of the themes as well they're trying to to fulfill the prophecy of the black flags mm. coming from Khorasan or whatever right and and yeah. they want they want the mahdi to come back little <laughs> do they know there's no mahdi coming back yeah. Yeah, they won't be they won't be successful. <laughs> They're not successful. I mean, and and it was like a light bulb. I don't know if it's a light bulb moment, but a a moment of realization for many Westerners. There was a Japanese guy. There's a bunch of British people that went to join ISIS, and they found out, okay, this is not Medina. There's no angels coming. Mm -hmm. I'm basically screwed now because I just joined the terrorist group. Wow. I thought this is going to be like the angel. Like this is the the caliphate this is the like you know because they've been fed all this islamist garbage about yeah. you know the caliphate is the most important thing in islam and we need the caliphate and when the caliphate comes you have to give bayah because the hadith says if there's a caliph you have to give him bayah otherwise you'll die the death of ignorance right so they're like oh i gotta go give bayah to the caliph because there's a caliph declared <sighs> and and they're just naive and dumb and you know i mean there's no other way to put it but naive dumb and brainwashed if you join yeah, ISIS, yeah. Anyways, I'm getting, I don't want to talk about that. I'm getting emotional about that. But anyways, so what you said about, about this expiry day of the earth, you know how you said it is here. Allah says we made animals for you. Absolutely. Exactly. Animals and your wives. <laughs> they yeah. Are just animals. <laughs> with, oh with you, right? <laughs> like how, how would you expect to treat animals if they're made for you? Like, of course you're going to eat them. Of course you're going to slaughter them. Of course you're going to treat them like they're, they're your food. Yeah. And and to me, I mean to me, veganism or veganism veganism is is a more ethical standpoint. I mean, I still eat meat, but I acknowledge that from my perspective, veganism is ethically superior 
to eating meat because these are living beings oh, yeah. and you're harvesting them and you're eating them and you're killing them. They don't want to be eaten and they want to live. Sure, if you want to have them as a pet, that's a different story. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about you're, you're raising them to kill them and eat them. So yeah. if you think that's okay, that's fine. You can think it's okay, but realize to not do that, especially when there's alternatives. I mean, we have, you know, protein and we have vitamin B12 and all of these things you can supplement. Honestly, you don't need to kill animals for that. So yeah. I still eat meat. Again, I'm going to keep saying that I'm not, not being, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I eat meat still, but like if the option comes for like, you know, like um, lab grown meat or there's, there's going to be more options every day. There's more options. I will gladly take that. Because yeah. I think it's morally superior. I don't think we should be harvesting and killing animals for the organs and body parts because they're living creatures. They have feelings just like we do. And like, like, and and here's the thing: Yasukari actually had a video about this, where he talked about how, for Muslims, there's going to come a point in time where they're going to be c conflicted about eating meat, because mm. the rest of the world is going to have moved on. They're going to be That's like, right. we don't eat meat. You guys are barbarians now. You're still eating meat, and they'll be like. Yeah, but the Quran says, you know, you can eat meat. And now they're gonna be there's gonna be an ethical problem. And he was trying to show how morality changes, and he's saying we should stick to the you know the morality of the Quran, basically. But that was his point. But it's a good point that actually you guys are, I mean, all of us, not you guys, all of us are gonna look like barbarians eating animals. When yeah. the time comes when we don't eat animals anymore, we, people will look back on us and they'll say, Look at these barbaric people eating animals. Like, shame on you guys. Like, you guys did these things just like slavery. We look back as people that own slaves. We're like, you guys own slaves? What like, the hell is wrong How with barbaric you? is that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and I honestly think I'm <clears throat> the same thing will happen with eating meat. Yeah, I completely yep. agree. Yep. Sorry. Uh, yeah. And uh, again, uh, same as you. Like, I don't want to be a hypocrite and say, like, that uh, I don't eat meat, but I do. But I'm, like, always trying to take little extra steps. Because, uh, like, same as you said, it's like, like when you realize how similar we are to animals, and like they're they're not made for us, you start understanding that, like, it's not that different, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's a the the reason I think this is good is because it's a thought experiment. It's a good thought experiment. It shows you that even if you don't necessarily you know implement that, you can still agree that it would be better. Yeah. And people that don't agree, it's better. I mean, I, we can have that conversation with them another time. That's not the point of this topic. That's not the point of this channel even to talk about veganism. Yeah. <laughs> but I just I just think, honestly, Ibrahim, you, know, you guys made a good point. Really, really good point about subjugating, about the expiry date of the earth. And, you know, just like what I added about the world ISIS and even Christian yeah. fundamentalists wanting oh, yeah. to bring the end of the world. Oh, man. Do you think, and, and just to add one more thing to that, sorry, then I'll let you guys continue. When you, when you see your life as limited meaning there's no hereafter don't you think and both of you can answer this don't you think that makes your life more valuable okay so before before i go into that let me just say a few <laughs> the veganism yeah. thing. so um yeah so that's actually one that's actually something that i think about very very often so being being in just like in the biological scientists um like i'm able to get a uh, perspective that a lot of people who are not in this field get okay one thing is that um like we are animals and in, in the truest sense possible okay um if you think eating a sheep is okay you're not like it's not that far of a jump to say eating a human is also like if you kill a sheep you will see its heart you will see its blood you will see its liver. You will see every organ that you have represented in that sheep. Okay, every single organ that you have, any pain that you can feel, it can feel it as well. Okay, um, and so when we talk about eating meat and all that stuff, um, and maybe I should prelude to say uh, I still eat meat occasionally, but I do it very, very rarely. Um, so I only do it, for example, if I go to my parents' house when you know they're. They don't know that I, you know, that that I like, you know, have these, you know, or I lack a, I lack a belief now and all that stuff anymore. But uh, so I have to, you know, put on an act for them. So I eat, but you know, I live alone, so I really don't eat meat. Like I am very close um, to just becoming a vegan or a vegetarian. You, just, you should you should explain how like we actually don't need that much meat in our life. Oh, yeah. So I think from a biological standpoint. 
Oh yeah, we can we, we can go into that. So yeah, so evolutionarily, humans actually, even though we have we have added meat to our diet, this was relatively a recent invention in our like story of like you know just in our evolution story, I suppose. Um, and the evidence for this actually exists in our in the cells that line our stomachs. Again, this is going very technical, very deep, but still, uh, when you when you um when you like you know when you um like look into it when you really look into like how humans are built or how hum how human body is structured and how um biochemically it functions it actually knows how to handle plant matter like cooked plant matter a lot better than you know like eating meat so you know what happens you know like the west for example we eat a lot of meat in the west and we have higher rates of cancer higher rates of heart disease, higher rates of obesity and things of that sort. Um, so eating meat, our body knows how to handle it, but it's not supposed to be at this level that we're doing now. So you can even make a scientific case for why you should become vegan if you want, a health a health case. Um, so, uh, and aside from just being moral and stuff like that. But of course, we're never gonna learn these lessons from the Quran, right? <laughs> you know, come eat, you're supposed to like, kill your own sheep and sacrifice it to God for some reason. Oh, I don't know. It's, it's all very primitive. It's all very primitive is yeah. what I can say. So, um, just so we don't make anyone mad, let's get, well, let's continue back with the story. <laughs> sure. I, mean, I think this was a good place to, this is a good thing to mention because honestly, there's more to life than just talking about Islam and Absolutely. I think all of these things are very important. And, and this is the best way to kind of uh, deliver this healthy dose of um, morality to 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 subscribers or viewers or whatever, because you know people are not going to watch a video on veganism. But as part of a conversation, we can talk about this and connect it back to the religious morality and how the religious morality is inferior, right? It does connect. There's, there's no it. there's no there's no incentive to make lab meat from an Islamic perspective. There's no. not. Slaughter the animal. Allah loves when you slaughter animals in His name. Yeah. Allah is jealous when you slaughter animals in other gods' names. Like it's like a competition for Allah or something, right? And yeah, these like, gods don't exist. So why does it? Why is it a problem for Allah if these gods don't even exist? <laughs> like, like, why does Allah say, "Don't worship me over any other god"? Like, there is no other god. So what's the point? Like, why is that even mentioned? Yeah, I don't it, know. What, yeah, it's it's hilarious. It's like, odd, isn't it? It's odd. It is odd. And what you said about the special exception. Sorry, I know I said we should we should get back to the topic, but I can't help it. <laughs> what you said about eating humans. There's no logical reason why you can't. I mean, if you if you think that it's you uh -oh. know, wrong to do all these things, then wouldn't it be? It, it would basically if you don't think it's okay to eat meat, it's not like you said a far jump to eating humans because, yeah. frankly speaking, we're, we're basically the same. The only difference is in our morality, we make a special exception. And right. you say, oh, no, you can't eat humans. Why? Because, okay, we're conscious beings or whatever, or we have feelings or whatever, or we're smarter. I mean, there isn't, there's a point to be made that we are more intelligent and all that. But but at the end of the day, you're, if you're going to harvest the organs of another living being, I mean, there's movies about this where humans are harvest, harvested as, as um, like yeah. The Matrix is an example of this, where humans are used as um, conduits or as food mm. sources or whatever, right? So anyways, I feel like I'm, we've gone on too much yeah. about this topic. <laughs> so yeah, should we get back to the you're, story then? Um, or, yeah, you're asking um, how, like, what do you value your life more once yes. you know that it's like basically yeah. the only life you, you have, Thank right? you, yeah. Well, okay. I'll, start, I'll start by answering at least from my standpoint. When, when I left, it definitely seemed that way at first, I felt scared and I felt very limited in a, in a way I just felt like, oh, this runs out because I was used to the fact that I had infinite life after this. So um, going to finite life at first was a very tough feeling, but I would say eventually after some time, I started basically making the most out of it because it is the only one I have. So I started learning more things i started adding like more education more hobbies more friends i started to try to i guess hone every opportunity i can get um because i am now realizing that this is a limited time before i would look at it more oh this is infinite i can just sit there and kind of like not have to do anything and not have to make the most out of every moment because i have infinite life after this so yeah that was my standpoint. Uh, Eunice, how is it for you? 
Yeah, so for me, I think it's uh, it's a little mixed. So uh, at first, I would say um, I felt that I felt a little liberated, to be honest with you. Like, I felt that I don't have to worry about, you know, saving myself from eternal hell or, you know, watching people like burn and I'm supposed to be happy about it. I mean, this is, I mean, this is what, this is kind of the narrative is, you know, the believers laugh as the non-believers burn, you know, like very sadistic, very weird, like, you know, very weird. But um, honestly, I came across a video um, by, and I forgot his name now, it's a YouTube ex-Muslim, um, uh, yeah. I, Ridwan, yeah, no, 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 not Ridwan, no. Um, Hassan Radwan, yeah, Hassan Radwan, yeah. Wow. I had a feeling. I had a feeling. <laughs> yeah, the first time, yeah. So uh, I came across a video from him a long time ago, way when I was still kind of fresh out, I guess. Um, and it was talking about heaven. It was talking about you know Jannah and what it's supposed to be and all of this. And honestly, I became kind of disinterested. You know, it was very materialistic. It was like you have golden walls and golden bricks and couches and raisins and rivers of milk. And honey. <laughs> yeah, it's even as a kid that wasn't appealing. It was yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it this was, is all it's all Arab centric, right? Like seventh century. Yeah, Arab, not even Arab, like yeah. seventh century. Yes, yes. I actually, I don't, I don't, I, yeah, I don't. I don't know if if um, Yunus felt the same way, but like. Actually, as a kid, I imagined that if I do go to heaven, that I will basically make myself come back to earth with like superpowers or something. <laughs> that was that was my idea. I think Eunice has a similar concept. Yes, I don't know. Like, I sorry to interrupt, Eunice. Go ahead. <laughs> no, that's a good point. <laughs> that's a great point. Exactly. Like the idea of Islamic heaven. This is very seventh century centric. You know, male centric. <laughs> male centric yeah. view of how happy yeah. it could be. Okay. Yeah. Um. And it's not, it wasn't very appealing to me. So it's exact same that Ibrahim thought, like, I was like, okay, well, you can do anything, right? In heaven. So I'll be like, I wouldn't even want all that. I would just kind of want to come back to earth, but with superpowers. Like, I, like, I would just like, you know, that, I mean, that was it. That was good enough for me, you know? I mean, so, so yeah. So going back to the question, um, I was a little mixed. I was at some point, I was like, I'm okay with this. Like, I'm okay if I just, you know, die and that's the end of it. Because honestly, heaven doesn't seem that interesting to me, um, and hell is obviously not, you know, interesting as well. So, <laughs> so, um, so that was kind of my thought. But then I started to think more along lines of what Ibrahim was thinking about how this life is precious. Like it actually is, is meaningful now. I mean, I mean, life compared to eternal life is nothing. It's truly meaningless. If you wanna, if you wanna say life is meaning, it has any meaning, it doesn't have meaning in religion, <laughs> because there is this this idea of eternity. So, like this life becomes meaningless. It literally becomes meaningless. Um, so, that was that was kind of my thought on it. So now I yeah. view life as precious. I need to make the most of it. I need to try to help people. I need to try to make the world better. Because I need to try to leave a mark. Yeah, just just have some sort of impact, you know, um, yeah. and learn about it. That's that's the main thing that drives me is the Explore you know, it. exploring and learning. Wow, like ever since I got into science, I've just been absolutely just. I mean, I've just been enthralled with just scientific thinking and just learning about how the world works like wow it is just fascinating and honestly i want to say that's my purpose in life is just learning and then <laughs> you know um maybe sharing that knowledge with people and you know and uh, just making it better you know so yeah. life without life without islam much 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 better much more meaningful um yeah much and much more realistic much more practical you know other than just praying, you can actually do something, you know? Yeah. So I like I, it. I, <clears throat> rather than praying for something, you actually go yeah. out there and try to do it. Right. So, I want to say, yeah. I want to ask you guys something. Um, why didn't you, when you said finite life, again, there's two of you, so both of you can answer this according to your own 
way you see the world. Why didn't you guys become Christian? Like both of you are saying finite life or whatever. It didn't it didn't appeal to you? Other religions didn't appeal to you, like Christianity or something, Buddhism, Hinduism, something like that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. So yeah. So uh, yeah. Good question. Good question. Right. So like you left one religion. Why didn't you just like see if another one was true? Right. Okay. Here's the point. Once you learn that, <laughs> it, just, it goes back to what Ibrahim was saying. Once you see the picture for what it is, it's impossible to see it any other way. So religion yeah. has one view of seeing the world and it's unscientific. It is, um, it's frankly wrong. And so once you just have a basic scientific understanding of how the world actually works, you became like religion is uninteresting to you. It becomes almost like a story. Like that's how, and honestly, this is how religion is viewed in the academic lens. It's, 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 a uh, it's culture. It's, it's, it's a human, yeah. it's a mythology. It's just interesting stories that humans have told themselves in order to, you know, just live in this harsh environment that we live in, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's really the way it is. So I didn't go to Christianity or Hinduism or Buddhism or any other religion um, because they're not true. I mean, that's basically <laughs> it. For, that's for me, one thing that like, uh, that made me kind of never even bother is while I was in the religion, I was always occupied with like basically uh, proving to other religions how like how wrong they are and how right I am. So, uh. um, <clears throat> uh, but I always found some Buddhist teachings like meaningful, but I just choose to like take what's meaningful to me out of it, out of any religion really, including Islam. Yeah. Take out of it what I find valuable and what I can use to be a better person, make the world better. And the just kind of discard the rest. The but practicality like, of it. Yeah, exactly. But once, I guess, um, once like you see all the light in the canopy, I guess, you you start seeing all of them fit into that same picture. You're like, oh, it's the same, kind of like the same thing, just with different flavors. Like the same thing with a different language, a different culture, a different Absolutely. heritage. It just evolved differently. Um, but yeah. Yeah, very good for you. So Eunice, is it is it more to uh, add to the story before I I do have a couple questions, but I'll I'll wait and see if there's anything else you wanted to add. Um, Ibrahim told me one thing before before we started, which uh, Ibrahim maybe you can answer. You said that Eunice waited for the right time to tell you before he actually told you that he left Islam. Um, do you want to like explain that a bit? What you meant by that? So so uh, I believe for for a very long time, um, we like he was not a Muslim and I was. And he didn't say anything. So um, he noticed he would, t I felt like looking back at it now, I noticed that he would like kind of test me with some subject. For example, we'd go to like, <laughs> like a place that could be haunted or something. And he would say, like, he would drop things like, oh, but don't you think like that's not real? And, I'd, and like, and I would completely dismiss it. Um, so yeah, he, yeah. he kind of waited until I don't know if he waited strategically knowing that this time will come or not, but like when he told me, I was already like kind of like wobbling on that floor of like something's off here. Like I wasn't as strong and certain, I guess, if that made sense. Um, I yep. was already like asking questions. I was already exploring. I was already doing things like that. So, and then that's when he decided to tell me, he didn't just like come out and tell me immediately as it happened. He saw that I was open to learn new things and, the new perspectives, and I and I think he took that opportunity. I don't know, Eunice. What do you? What is it? How does it look on your end? Yeah. So glad you brought that up. So yeah, that was something. <laughs> when I first left, uh, I didn't want to tell Ibrahim at first um, because I didn't think he was based on what I went through. I didn't think he was going to be able to handle it. You know. Um, so the main thing, and, and it's not because like, you know. Um, he is just at the time, I just didn't feel like I was ready to really tell anyone. And of course, if I'm going to tell anybody, it's going to be him. Like he was going to be the one, to f the first to understand it. So if he wasn't ready to hear it, then like who will, right? No one else would. So I would, um, <laughs> what well, he mentioned the haunted house, actually, that's a funny story. So one time we did go to a place that was supposedly believed to be haunted by some Christian friends that we have. Uh, it's an abandoned church. Uh, it had like a Jesus statue that everyone in the town believed that 
if you drive by it, Jesus's eyes would follow you as you like go by. I mean, this place was haunted according to these people, right? Of course. Yeah, and if you look at it, it would follow you and bad things would happen yeah, and stuff like that. Right. And so I didn't believe at the time. Like I know fully well that there was nothing to it whatsoever. Yeah. Okay? So I put up a challenge to my Christian friend. I was like, all right, let's go to this place. He's never been. Okay. He's never been, but he's just drove in past it. And he sworn to his life that just Jesus statue has followed him and, you know, things of that sort. And he was telling me that she, like, this is the day you, he was going to, he was telling me that this is the day you're going to die. Okay. Yeah. He, he would say, like, he would say like, this is, this is it. Like, this is the day you're going to die. Like, if you go here, you're, you're going to die. Right. Um, and I was like, all right, challenge accepted. And I invited, I invited Ibrahim. <laughs> I was like, all right, let's go check out this haunted house. And Ibrahim at the time was believing. So I did not want to go. I did not want to go. I remember that. I was like, like, can we like not, can we just do anything else? <laughs> like why mess with it? Why mess with the gin? Like see, he, my friend who is Christian or our friend, he was thinking it's like, like, I don't know, demons or whatever. And I was thinking from my Islamic background, oh, it's the, the gin, of course. Yep. Uh, it's obvious. Like, yeah. <laughs> what else would it be? <laughs> It's very interesting, actually. So uh, I think uh, Ibrahim at the time, he brought like a, a, a part of the Quran with him, like, a, yeah, to protect himself. Yeah, it, it was the Askar, like that he made right. in the beginning of the day in the evening. Yeah. So, so, this yeah. Would, so this would protect him. And then my Christian friend brought holy water and like salt and a nail and a gun. And a gun. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> and so I, I was ready. I was protected with the Oscar. I was ready. So, so, so Abdullah Samir, you can just imagine how serious this situation was. Yeah, yeah. So you believers who believe this very strongly, and it was scary versus me who didn't believe at the time, but they didn't know that I believed. Um, so I was like, all right, let's go. So we went, and guess what? Like we like hugged the statue. We like. We like played around in the yard. We like, <laughs> like nothing happened whatsoever. Okay. Yeah. And that was kind of a big moment, I guess, um, you know, for me. Like, I was like, okay, this is, I mean, it, it proved like my worldview was kind of put through its test. Like, I mean, this was, this was believed by people for generations. And I just kind of debunked it just like that. You walked you know? through the fire and you survived. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't know how that made Ibrahim feel at the time. Maybe he believed. And so he was like, oh, the Oscar, uh, you yeah, know. Yeah, the Oscar protected me at the time, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so for him, that was his view. Um, but yeah, so I did wait, though. I did wait. I did try to just, you know, probe him a little bit, to, you know, ask him questions here and then. Sometimes I would ask him. <laughs> I don't know if he remembers, but that sometimes I would ask him questions and I would say, hey, I have a friend who has this question about Islam. And I would ask him that question and see how he answers it. And then yeah, I remember that <laughs> I would gauge, you know, I would gauge things like that. So um, I actually took these questions and sometimes I couldn't answer them or my answer felt like forced. And I would ask other people and I continued to ask people in a way. And like, I never got the answer like that was satisfying, but I just would dismiss it after a little bit. Oh, added yeah. to my pile of knots <laughs> of the patches. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that was, that was pretty much it. Um, and you know, I'm glad I told him, I'm glad I have someone to be able to just share these stories with him and, uh, for him to just be able to understand, um, and just kind of be there for me, you know, and through it. And I was there for him. So, um, but uh, look, I'm glad in the end that he didn't hold on to religion and just dogmatically just, kept believing anyway, you know, and just kind of viewed me as a, you know, an outcast and stuff like that. So it's very appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about how you feel now and where you go from here. Cause I mean, I mean, that'd be a good way to end this. Yeah. Like how is like, how do you, I mean, we kind of talked a bit about it, how you see life is more valuable now and how you, you know, you see all the religions is basically made up. Um, right. And I do have a few questions that people have been asking them if you have time, right. but we're getting, it's getting kind of long. Let's, let's just end it on, on something positive. How is your life now? Or it could be negative. Maybe your life sucks now <laughs> that you left Islam and you're depressed and you have no <laughs> new life. And now, oh, what was me? you know, you're just going to jump and the hole that you have is oh. so big that you just jump. I mean, frankly speaking, I think that's why some people 
will ju- jump to another religion. Yeah. Because it's like there's something that they're missing that they, they don't know how to deal with it. So they just go yep. to another religion because Islam can't be true. So they have yeah. Christianity or something else, right? So they so have a I hole could, that they need to fill with something else. Yeah. So uh, so we'll, let's uh, let's both of you, both of you can answer that. And I guess um, uh, Ibrahim, you go first this time. Okay. So for for me right now, where I'm in the life, I so I was kind of fortunate enough that I actually um, so got to move soon after um, that whole thing started, like me starting to ask questions. Um, I kind of took it as like a like a global interview for everyone. Like I would ask almost everyone I meet, everyone I uh, encounter, everyone I knew already, I would ask them all these questions and see what they have to add to the table um, to like the whole religion thing, like religious Muslims, non-religious Muslims, uh, Christians, all these, everyone from any background, I would take the opportunity to ask them questions to get to know their perspectives more. And um, so, yeah, I got to, I, I got to find kind of new friends in a way. Um, from the friends I had, and I never felt completely comfortable with the friends I had. Um, so, yeah, I started getting into more groups, more involved in different groups. I kind of had that, um, I'm trying to figure out a way to describe it, but it felt like um, unchaining in a way, because for me before, a criteria to, have to be someone's friend or to do something with someone is that they had to be Muslim, otherwise they won't be blessed or something. And like who I am naturally, I'm very, very social. So I started like basically being unbound and like just went all out and like discovered that um, feeling of like tapping into who I am and who I want to be, which is getting to know all kinds of people and getting to be friends and close with a lot of people. And um of course, in, in, a, in, a, in an Arabic country, that would have been easier. But here, that was always something that was holding me back for years. Um, so I got what, to know a lot of people. Country? What do you mean? What would be easier? Like getting to know people and like getting to have friends. If you're in a Muslim country, obviously, everyone around you is Muslim. So oh, that's yeah, not yeah. as much of an issue. Yeah. But when I came here, um, I kind of started to like... Oh, they, like, because yeah. you, you didn't want to be friends with non-Muslims because you want I didn't to be authentic to what you were taught. Okay. Exactly. I didn't want to like have like not blessed Bad relationships in, in a way. Life. Bad influences and stuff like that. So um, when I started um, going all out and like becoming friends with like people at work, people who I play soccer with, like like they want to go like play FIFA, like all kinds of things. Like I just started be- becoming more true to who I am and who I want to be. And then when I moved, I also like found so many more opportunities I found so many like jobs that I wanted to do like things that were like for example a uh, very very silly example but let's say I want to I love Target and I want to work at Target I wouldn't work there because in a twisted way I can think oh they sell alcohol and some of their money has alcohol so it's forbidden <clears throat> so I'm not going to do that let's yeah I want to work for NASA yeah, yeah same it's, thing it's perfectly I mean that's what most that's how Muslims think they think yeah. that if there's any sort of haram, influ- I, my money is haram, my income, my food becomes haram, so I can't yeah. do that job. And and like I've been to Islamic lectures and conferences and stuff where they talk about you know avoiding haram, don't work for banks, don't work for insurance companies, don't work for anyone that works for an insurance company or any any company yeah. that services a bank. Um, you know, so that that actually eliminates a lot of jobs, right? There. And then if you're if you're a retail store clerk, what do you do if there's alcohol and there's beef? I mean, yeah, um, food there, and yeah, it's difficult as a Muslim living in the West. Yeah, if you want to follow course. it, right? Yeah, and there was there was just a lot of restrictions that just stopped being there, and like I would I would kind of notice that they're not there like slowly later. I'd be like, oh wow, I can like I can explore that thing that I want to do. Oh, I can learn piano now and not feel bad. I can uh, do martial arts. I can do this. I can do that. And then I can like, oh, I can work um, as a peer coach. I, I can work as a, as a blah, blah, blah. I can work as a teacher. I can do all these things that um, allow me to connect to people. And I would always keep the attitude of learning from others. And like, I would try to learn from anyone regardless. Like even kids, I would ask them questions and see how they think. And like, they actually brought a lot to the table. Um, but I would say there was a lot of doors um, that opened up to me like career-wise and education-wise, uh, relationship-wise, friendships, everything. Like um, I started becoming true to who I am. I was 
I, I'm still here and there more conflicted about like the purpose in life and stuff like that. But one way I look at it now um, through learning more philosophies, which is another thing that I kind of like was scared of. Yeah. Like, for example, the whole thing about Buddhism, like I would be almost like I was, it was always interesting to me and I wanted to learn some of their things or go to their temples and like just experience their life. Uh, and now I can do that and learn whatever I want to learn out of it and like be free. Um, but one mess, like one way of looking at it is, um, it, I think it, I think it was Alan Watts, if I'm not sure, what, one, of, one, of, one of the philosophers I like to listen to. Uh, he explains it as looking at life as like a music or a song itself, like or a dance. I know like these are both things that are kind of haram, I guess. But um, my point is, instead of like waiting for the end of the song, instead of waiting for the song to end to find meaning in the song, you kind of just listen to the melody and enjoy the whole process with its ups and downs, with its bads and good and all of that. So that's, that's kind of how I try to look at life. I still try to grow. I'm still trying to learn more. And I, um, yeah, I just want to continue to be a better person so I can give back to the world and not because I'm a great person or anything, I just find it pleasing for my own self to give back and make the world better. So you can look at it as a selfish way, but at the end, I, I think it's something that's good for everyone or good for the planet to give back and to, yeah, just kind of serve a little bit because I feel like I've been taking a lot, if that makes sense. Beautiful. Um, and yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. It just shows you that you don't need religion, frankly speaking. I mean, we can take, you know, from the, the best of human philosophy over the generations, um, even religion, is, is religious inspiration. There's nothing wrong with, you know, finding inspiration in the Bible in certain quotes, even in the Quran. Uh, probably not the verse that talks about chopping off the unbelievers' heads or whatever. Yeah. But <laughs> more beautiful verses, I mean, in the Quran. And um, I, I think a lot of um, mindfulness training is, is very helpful that, that we find in ancient Eastern philosophies, yeah. um, religions, beautifully said. Thank you, Ibrahim. That was yeah. amazing. Thank you, Abdullah. Yunus, uh, would you like to answer as well? Yeah. Um, yeah, that was an awesome answer by, by Ibrahim. So, yeah, for me right now, kind of where I am in my life, um, I'm mainly just focusing on my studies. Uh, so, as you said, I'm, I'm studying as a scientist right now, working um working in embryology in that field and I'm actually working on my first um, ever publication so I'm about to I'm about to be a real scientist very soon so uh, been enjoying that been enjoying learning and just nose diving into the science of everything essentially um, and that's been really fun and that's kind of what my what my life's purpose is right now I, I would say is just to learn about the world, you know? Um, it sounds very naive, but it's it's very freeing, you know? Like Ibrahim said earlier, like once you know how something works or once you know how uh, something really is, it like, it like opens your mind up and frees you to do certain things that you didn't know was possible. And so, that, that's, why, that's, why it's so that's why it's so beautiful. And that's what I'm trying to do now I'm just trying to continue on that trajectory. I don't have, I am as happy as, you know, like I am more happy than I ever was when I was, uh, when I was a Muslim. When I was a Muslim, yeah. I, was, I was only content. I was just, I was content. I felt at peace or whatever, right? I felt like, all right, God is protecting me. Like everything is fine. But I didn't have this profound feeling of um, freedom and the free the freedom to learn this was something i never like had as a muslim the freedom to truly learn not just learn more about your religion i mean learn about the world learn about the universe and how it works and, yeah, that's, my and main, that's my main driver one thing i wanted to add to what Eunice said like the freedom to learn without feeling guilty that you're learning about something else before you learn and become a full expert on your religion because if you yeah. look at it there's always more to learn in your religion and that's obviously the thing that you should be learning about instead of wasting your time reading a book about astronomy or something like that so right. yeah absolutely um you guys hit so many beautiful points and um you know like richard dawkins said the same thing Eunice, that every day he wakes up 
and Neil deGrasse Tyson, I forget one of them, maybe both of them, they did it this to them, they don't feel any less awe at the universe than like a theist, maybe even yeah. more than a theist does because we don't even know where yeah. it came from. We don't have an actual explanation. They just come up with an explanation that they think. Yeah. And so this drives him every day to learn more, to discover the universe, how it came about, you know, the deep questions and mysteries, you know, we've knocked down a few of them. Evolution is one of the biggest ones, of course, um, right. maybe abiogenesis and there's some other ones as well. And and these, these things, you know, not even necessarily these ginormous uh you know questions of life and meaning of life type of answers but even the small things you know discovering small things that will improve the world and um i want to i want to say that um i want to plug uh ex muslims of north america both of you are in the us and for anyone else that needs a support group that can help you uh, as an ex muslim uh, do check out ex-Muslims of North America. It's primarily a real life group, meaning they have um, meetings and stuff like that where you can meet other ex-Muslims that, that have gone through the same thing. It's a support group for people that need help. They need to talk to other people that have that have gone through this and how they dealt with the parents or how they dealt with the parent finding out that they had alcohol in the bag, bag or whatever. And, you know, stuff like that or how to tell the parents or how to tell the spouse or whatever. So I'm going to plug ex-Muslims of North America. Please do join it if you're ex-Muslim and you need support or you want to help out. I mean, it's for both um and i want to say you know you covered you guys covered everything that i want to talk about in this conversation you know Eunice, it's amazing that you overcame you know you started you know not even at first base you started before first base when you were you were you you weren't given a proper childhood education with the basic skills that you needed to to do well in this world and somehow you overcame all that you not just overcame all that you found your way out of this dogmatic brainwashing that was put upon you that is very difficult to find your way out of i mean especially if that's your whole world your world your whole existence i mean that's something to be proud of and something to be so thankful for i'm so thankful for that every day like ibrahim what you said it feels like being unchained like that's exactly how it feels you the mental chains the knots in your head that instead of leading to the falak to get rid of the knot yeah <laughs> of the these are the, the mental knots that get unraveled and the world it just it just fits man the the scientific everything makes more sense it makes so much more sense Where, whereas with with religion you you're constantly scratching like, the head as to why yeah. like why is this suffering of the type of suffering that we have why are the all of these inconsistencies in the explanation between you know and so when when you when you leave religion and you know it feels like being unchained it feels yeah. like the knots of being freed from your mind yeah you want to say something about him no no i'm just agreeing with you yeah and and you know and the other thing Eunice, is i wanted to highlight the the struggle of being authentic the struggle of having a good friend who is religious and not knowing whether you should tell them or not tell them because on one hand you want to be authentic i mean all of us have this desire to to show our true selves that's what intimacy is intimacy is to yeah. be yourself i mean that's why when you're with the spouse you're able to get naked with your spouse that is true intimacy because you're exposing yourself and all yeah. your faults and all of your words and everything and your your, yep. your roles that you might have when you're my age, you're, you're exposing yourself to, to someone else. And that's what intimacy is. We all want, you yep. know, we all want to be authentic. But sometimes, you know, unfortunately, it's not possible to do that. And and so it always becomes a risk, right? Like, should yep. I tell my best friend that I'm not Muslim? And what if he doesn't want to be my friend anymore? And what if my it'll ruin my relationship with my spouse? Or what if it'll ruin my relationship with my best friends or my parents? And it's yeah. always a struggle, you know, and, and, you know, I'm so glad that it worked out well for you that you actually told your friend and Ibrahim, you know, you both, this ended up well for you too. Both of you are able to leave Islam together and, you know, yeah. embark on this journey. And, um, you know, it's, I, I just think this is, a, the, I think we should just end it on that because this is beautiful. And, you know, thank you guys so much for sharing your story. I was looking forward to this and it, it was just as, as I expected. Uh, do you guys want to add any final words just before we sign off? Um, I'd like to say that um, if someone out there has a fear of telling someone who's, who they're very close to, uh, they honestly should do it. And if they end up losing that person, it's hard, 
but they make room for someone who actually accepts who they are truly. Um, at the end of the day, if you're faking it, then you're not being their friend. You're pretending to be their friend at the end of the day. I was lucky enough to have a friend that was with me from the beginning. Uh, I know not everyone feels the same way, but with everyone I've told and I haven't told, uh, it feels the same way. I'm either faking it or I'm true to this person and they truly accept who I am and work with me from there. So, yeah, that's. That's wow, awesome. that's that's a good way to put it. Yeah, obviously, if you're in a Muslim country, there's additional risks involved, and that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about if you're safe and you're able to tell. Yeah, some aside from safety, of course. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and this is great advice because when you guys, by you guys doing this, you make it easier for everyone else to to do the same. And um, yeah, exactly. Yunusa, do you want to add any any final words? I was. Uh no, you guys put it beautifully. Thank you so much, Abdullah Samir, for, you know, just agreeing to do this and have us on and have us just, you know, talk to people, uh, basically. So we an honor to be here, of course. Yeah, we really appreciate it, man. So thank you for doing this. I uh, thank you everyone for for joining this live stream. And um honestly, this was a great conversation. Thank you to both of you. Um do share this video with others so that others can learn from this story, can um, you know benefit from the wisdom of Ibrahim and Yunus, my two brothers who I've never met. Maybe I'll meet you guys one day. Uh, thank you all and uh, see you again. Yeah, we will. <laughs> see you. I, don't disconnect. I'm going to end the broadcast. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.